Hello and welcome to the channel and today we're going to look at the Astra Militarum Codex. It is 8th edition, this codex, and the improvements and the layout, the fluff, the lore is so much more superior in my opinion than that of previous editions. This is a really well laid out codex, really well done and overall it is superb codex. The army's improved as well and yeah really pumped up about this codex. Uh, this is the second book review on the channel so basically the main factions that I collect I'll be doing book reviews for. So without further ado let's take a look what's inside. So you've got that cover there, front cover Nicely there, Astra Militarum, the Imperial Guard. I like to call them by both names, don't care which one, like Imperial Guard or Astra Militarum. Your contents nicely laid out. Introduction as to what basic outline of the Imperial Guard's role is in the 41st millennium. A nice illustrated artwork there. Uh, you can tell by the picture straight away the strength of the Imperial Guard is just sheer numbers. Uh, but they do take a ton of casualties in the, doing so. Millions of casualties, probably in a month, something like that. <laughs> you can just imagine. But there's billions of them. Hammer of the Emperor, they are called. That's their uh, shield of the humanity, how it's organised. Lots of lore. Nicely laid out. The basic structure of an infantry platoon. Uh, this would be primarily for Cadians and how it would lay out, but in the 41st millennium, that's how it's laid out, technically speaking, depending on what kind of style of regiment you want to do. This just gives you a basic outline. Now you can do that. There you go. Lots of lore. Uh, this here is the regimental organisation I'll be doing for my 18th Cadian uh, Courtism's Roughnecks, that is the name of my regiment. Uh, Courtism is uh, Latin for Barker, in case you didn't know. So you know the answer now why I call them Courtism's Roughnecks. So what I've done is copied the basic layout of the Cadian 180th Infantry Regiment, which is similar. This is, this is based on the 18th, uh, 13th Black Crusade uh, formation. You can tell there's a, they've taken a battering uh, as chaos would do so against the Imperial Guard. So it's really a regiment on the defensive and it's under siege which is the law behind how my regiment's organized. A galaxy of war which is cool and then you've got the Cadence, different color scheme. They're all cool color schemes actually. Quite impressed. Cat Chance. Armageddon Steel Legion. Volstoria. Valhalla. Talan. Uh, regiments of Distinction. So these are different regiments you can customise and do your own. But except for Mordian Iron Guard, which are a set regiment. Um, most of these regiments are in lead, sadly. They haven't done them in plastic. Uh, I wish they would do, uh, which is a bit of a shame. But one day, you never know, they may do these in plastic or fine cast or whatever. And then you've got uh, all sorts of different regiments, actually. These are new regiments, the new three regiments here. Different characters here. Yeah. And it's the Chronicle of the Imperial Guard, major key conflicts in the 40k universe. We've got a famous illustration here, iconic illustration. You've got, you've got Creed and you've got Color Sergeant Kell, who has sadly fallen. Company commanders, uh, tank commanders, these are the primary main units you'd have. And the Imperial Guard, platoon commanders, infantry squads, uh, heavy weapon squads, veterans, chimeras, toroxes, sentinels, hellhounds, ordnance batteries, hydras, 
Manticores, Death Strikes, and you've got the Lehman Russes, all the different variants. Very powerful tank. Now in the new edition, and super heavy tanks, which have got even better, and all the variants of the super heavy tank as well, which is very cool. And key characters, Lord Castle and Creed, and you've got Colour Sergeant Kill. Um, then you've got Knight Commander Pusk, Colonel Ironhand Strachan, Gunnery Sergeant Harker, gives you all the lore and the story of the background, basic outline. Warriors of the Faith, Servants of the Omnius Sire, uh, Militarum Tempestus, Valkyries, and Commissars. Commissar Yarrick. Ogrins, Nordidok, Rattlings, Primaris Psychers, Waverden Psychers, Regimental Advisors, and then you've got the showcase of the Citadel miniatures. There you go. They haven't really made any new miniatures, but uh, yeah, it's all right for me. I can still live with that. But hopefully they'll make new units for the Imperial Guard. Now in the diversity of games workshop, they've still got plenty of ideas. Catchans, Talons, and you got uh, Valhallans, and you got Cadians, and different colour scheme, which is quite cool actually. But very good. Tempestus, Atlas Tempestus, Forstorians. Yeah, and then you've got the basic uh, Imperial Guard army. This is the Claw of Key. And here we go, the Soldiers of the Imperium. Soldiers of the Imperium. Now, this is rather interesting. The big changes that the Codex has to offer. So it tells you the outline how it's done. So you've got keywords, regiment keywords, and that kind of thing. So, here are the orders. So I'll read them out to you. Uh, so what happens is, when issuing an order, it says here the unit may issue one order per turn to the soldiers under their command at the start of their shooting phase. So all the orders are done in the shooting phase. Uh, you declare them before you start shooting. Orders may only be issued to infantry units within six of this unit that have the same regiment keyword. So, for example, if I was a Cadian officer was issuing an order to a Cadian infantry unit, uh, then they would only apply that order will only apply to that unit. So you can't have a Cadian officer issuing orders to Mordian Iron Guard because they're a different uh, regiment. Uh, this units have the same regiment keyword, this unit. To issue an order, pick a target unit and choose which other which sorry which order you wish to issue from the table below. A unit only be affected by one order per turn. So it gives you the answer and how many orders you can issue to one unit per turn. So it's only one now. Which is kind of sensible, otherwise you can stack orders, which can be a bit crazy. But now they've, it says one order. So, the orders are, take aim, reroll hit rolls of one for all models in the ordered unit until the end of the phase. Pretty powerful. Uh, first rank fire, second rank fire. Uh, all las guns and all hotshot las guns in the ordered unit change their type to rapid fire two until the end of the phase. It's pretty powerful, uh, especially at close range when you get four shots per las gun. Uh, yeah, and with, yeah, it's pretty awesome. There's a famous, that's a very popular order that people will do. Uh, bring it down. Uh, this is really less common, but it can be quite useful. So it's kind of useful if you're more likely to hit, you get that benefit of re-rolling to wound. Bring it down, it's called. Re-roll uh, wound rolls of one for all models in the ordered unit until the end of the phase. Fords for the Emperor. The ordered unit can shoot this phase even if it advanced in the moving phase, so that's very handy. Uh, get back in the fight. The ordered unit can shoot this phase even if it fell back in the movement phase. So that's pretty handy. So like when you pull back from close combat, usually you can't shoot, charge or anything like that. However, 
if you issue this order, you can steal the chance to shoot. It's very handy. Move, move, move. Instead of shooting this phase, the order unit immediately moves as if it were the movement phase. It must advance as part of this move and cannot declare a charge during this turn. So you can basically, if you don't want to shoot or grab an, grab an objective very quickly, uh, move, move, move is the order to do, which is really handy at times. Fixed bayonets. Uh, this order can only be issued to units that are within one of an enemy. The ordered unit immediately fights as if it were the fight phase. So you can just get to fight, which is pretty powerful. So those are the orders, and then you've got regimental orders. So all I'll do is I'll read this section here, and we'll talk about Grite in advance in a second. So, regimental orders. Many Astra Militarum regiments maintain specialised training regimes, tactics, and even entire battlefield languages to direct their troops. The table below contains additional orders for use with the voice of command ability, which may be used by officers with the appropriate regiment keyword. For example, Kachan officers may issue the Kachan burn them out order in addition to any of the standard orders from the list on the previous page. Some of the orders below are noted as being tank orders. These may only be uh, issued to tank command, issued by tank commanders with the appropriate regiment keyword. In addition to those listed on their data sheet and using the rules for tank orders as described on their data sheet. So uh, these are like unique stratagem, uh, unique orders for the uh, Imperial Guard Regiment you want to use. So this is a Cadian order. So it's actually it's a tank order. It's called Pound Them to Dust. Um, for the duration of the phase, you can reroll the dice when determining the number of attacks the ordered model can make with the turret weapons, as described as the grinding advance ability above. We'll read that in a minute. They that use the randomly determined number, etc. Heavy D6. This can be very, very handy. So if you roll poorly for your ordnance, you can basically re-roll the ordnance dice and help. Uh, so for example, if you roll a one, then all of a sudden I get to re-roll it, and you roll a six. It can be very handy. Uh, cast gen order. Burn them out. You can re-roll the dice when determining the number of attacks the ordered unit can make with flamers and heavy flamers until the end of the phase. In addition, units targeted by the models from the ordered unit with these weapons do not gain any bonus to their saving throws for being in cover this phase. So it's kind of like the old rules for flamers where it says ignores cover, which is pretty handy. And now you've got Val Hallens, fire on my command. The ordered unit can shoot at enemy at the enemy units that are within one of friendly units until the end of the phase, but each time you roll a hit of a one for such an attack, resolve the attack against friendly units within one of the target unit instead. Uh, you may choose which friendly unit is hit. This order, this order may not be issued to units with which is within one of the enemy. So basically, you get to shoot, but then if you roll a one, you can shoot your own men. So you have to be a bit careful because it represents friendly fire, and Valhalla's are famed for uh, just getting the job done and caring not about lives. So they can afford to take heavy casualties. Full story. Until the end of the phase, the ordered unit can fire at. Um, you can fire. A unit can fire any of its weapons whilst they're even one of the enemy, regardless of the weapon's type. If they do so, they must target enemy units within one, even if they are, even if friendly units are within one of these units. It's pretty handy. Uh, Armageddon, Steel Legion, mount up. Uh, Armageddon Steel Legions are famed for loads of chimeras and infantry squads inside chimeras. So this is handy. Mount up. Until the end of the phase, the ordered unit can shoot and then immediately embark within a friendly Armageddon transport vehicle. As long as all models in the units are in three of the vehicle, this order may not be issued to a unit which disembarked in the preceding movement phase. So that's very powerful ability. So what happens is 
you have uh, in I think you have to get out on your previous turn and then you stay where you are and within three inches of the vehicle the next turn and then in the shooting phase you shoot and then you get inside the chimera after you've shot which is pretty handy and then you've got uh, Talan, which is a tank order. Get around behind them. The ordered, unit, the ordered model can move up to six in this phase, either before and after it shoots, as if it were the movement phase. This does not affect how the vehicle has moved for the purposes of determining how many times it can fire the turret weapon, as described in the grind advance. That's actually a really, really cool order. Uh, basically, if especially against close combat units. So you have like a Carnifex which is designed for close combat for example and it's quite near the Lehman Russ, it can shoot and then you can just pull back. Mm, it's pretty good. You can move up to six in this phase. So yeah, that's handy that is. And it does not affect the grind of us. Nice. Uh, elimination protocol sanctioned. This is the Militarum Tempestus. You can re-roll failed wound rolls for models uh, from the ordered unit when attacking an enemy vehicles or monsters or monsters in this phase. Which can be very handy as well against vehicles and monsters what they specialize for. So Mordian Iron Guard. So this is the Mordian's order. This is quite interesting. Uh, form a firing squad. Until the end of the phase, the ordered units can target characters with their rapid fire weapons, so it's only for rapid fire, uh, even if they are not the closest enemy unit. So, uh, you want to pick out a character at long range, and it's kind of like what uh, Warf, well, in general, warfare does, they try and knock out the officers so that communication breaks down. And that's what it represents here. It's actually a very useful order. So for characters, just be be careful of Mordians. <laughs> it's quite deadly when it comes to that. So we look on to the characters now. Lord Castellan Creed. Uh, he has a power level of four. And we'll check how many points he costs. Creed. Lord... Castellan Creed. There's only unique named characters. Here we go. Uh, Lord Castellan Creed is 70 points. He's movement 6, weapon skill 3 plus, ballistic skill 3 plus, strength 3, toughness 3, wounds 4, attacks 3, leadership 9, save 4 plus. Uh, he, Lord Castellan Creed is a single model armed with two hotshot las pistols and a power sword. Only one of this model may be included in your army. Uh, right, he has a hot shot last pistol, range 6, pistol, strength 3, AP minus 2, 1 damage. And he's equipped with a power sword. Uh, abilities, he has the voice of command, he has a refractor field, Lord Castellan Creed has a 5 plus invulnerable save. Tactical genius, if your army is battle forged, you receive an additional 2 command points if Lord Castellan Creed is your warlord. That is very, very handy. And what's very good about the Imperial Guard, in general, it is very easy to fit in a 2,000 point list, a Brigade Detachment. So, if you're fielding a Brigade Detachment, you would have, uh, well, yes, you could have uh, 12 Command Points, okay, that's, that's right, 12 Command Points, <laughs> and... Plus Creed's ability, if he's your HQ, if he's your Warlord, that's 14. And then you could fit a Spearhead Detachment on top of that. Because, yeah, like Lehman Russ is, for example. So that's 15 Command Points. 15 Command Points. That's super powerful. And uh, Command Points are key as well in 40k now. Supreme Commander. Lord Castellan Creed's voice of command ability has a range of 12, and he may use this ability three times to each of, you, each of your turns. Resolve the effects of the first order before issuing the second order, and so on. So, that's how it's done properly. 
nicely laid out. Yep, he's cool. So he has a keyword of Cadence, so he can only issue orders to Cadence. Company Commander. So these are the most not um, notable commanders of the Imperial Guard. Uh, he's the most famous, but these are more common. Basic Commander. So uh, he has all the basic stat lines as Creed, except he's leadership 8 and power level 2. And Company Commander, points wise. Uh, company commander is 30 points plus upgrades you got to add. Last pistol, frag grenade. So chainsaws, for, these weapons are for free. It gets plus the weapons in the armory, which we'll look at later. Weapons of war gear. So, voice command ability. Refractor field, 5 plus invulnerable save. It can issue two orders uh, in the shooting phase, which is nice. Cool. Four wounds, which is good. Can be very handy. So, now we're going to look at the tank commander. There are con considerable changes in this codex as compared to the previous index. A tank commander is all in alphabetical order. He is 167 points. So, what you get for 167 points is as follows. A tank commander is a single model and he rides to battle from the Capula Lehman Russ battle tank in which he is equipped with the battle cannon and heavy bolter. So let's look at the battle cannon. Battle cannon is... where are you? Range weapons, battle cannon. Battle cannon is 22 points. So you add that on top. And heavy bolter. Uh, let's be quick here. It's just eight points. So you add that on top. So that's what he comes with. So the battle cannon. Ah, there's another thing I forgot to do. We need to read the rules for grinding advance. Here we go. So we'll look at grinding advance quickly. This is for Lehman Russes in general. Okay, this is one of the great improvements of Lehman Russes. The Lehman Russ tank's sturdy frame allows it to keep up a fearsome rate for fire, even if it advances on its foe. If the model moves under half speed in its movement phase, i.e. it moves the distance in inches less than half than its current movement characteristic, it can shoot its turret weapon twice. Did you hear that? Twice. Uh, in the following shooting phase, and the turret weapon must target the same unit both times. Furthermore, uh, the hit rolls for this model's turret weapon do not suffer the penalty for moving and shooting heavy weapons. Uh, heavy weapon. The following uh, weapons are turret weapons, so it gives you clarification. So, battle cannon, eradicator, nova cannon, exterminator, auto cannon, vanquisher, battle cannon, demolisher cannon, executioner, plasma cannon, and the Punisher Gatling Cannon. So those that benefit from the Grind and Advance ability. So, now we look over the page here. This is incredible. Now, in the uh, 8th edition, in the Index, the Rosses weren't that good. But now, they are proper good. Grind and Advance, that means you don't suffer any penalties for moving with the turret weapon. And you get to shoot twice if it's under half move. That's right, twice. So a battle cannon now, instead of heavy D6, like it originally was in the index, is now, if you do under half move, it's heavy 2D6. And Lean Rust battle cannon is good now. It is great, and I take them in the army. They're fantastic. Uh, they're more than likely to, uh, you know, kill the enemy so to speak, and with the Cadian order you get to re-roll your ordnance if you don't like your roll on top of that. <laughs> it's fantastic. So, the battle cannon is range 72, heavy d6, strength 8, AP minus 2, d3 damage. A demolisher cannon, it's 2d3 if you're doing the grind advance, uh, so it's range 24, heavy d3, strength 10, AP minus 3, d6 damage. And the points for a demolisher cannon is where are you now? Demolisher 
cannon. Here we go, it is 40 points. It is expensive, but it's very powerful cannon. The Eradicator Nova Cannon. This is another great improvement to the previous edition. Eradicator Nova Cannon. Uh, range 36, heavy D6, slash 2D6 for grind and advance, and moving under half move. Uh, strength 6, AP minus 2, D3 damage. Okay. Another thing you mentioned about the Demolisher Cannon before I write it, read that out. When attacking with with the Demolisher Cannon, when there's models that are more five or more models, changes weapons type to D6 instead. So it's D6 shots. Pretty handy. And then for the Eradicator Nova Cannon, units attacked by this weapon do not gain the bonuses to their same throws for being cover. So it's basically a, a, an anti-cover weapon, so to speak. Very can be very handy. And then you've got the Executioner Plasma Cannon. And the Executioner Plasma Cannon is 20 points. That is pretty cheap. I was expecting it to be more expensive, but nope. It's good. Executioner Plasma Cannon. When attacking with this weapon, choose one of the profiles below. So, standard, which is basically an upgraded version of a plasma cannon. Instead of D3, it's D6. And remember, the grind advance is 2D6, with if you go under half move. So, it's range 36, heavy D6, strength 7, AP minus 3, 1 damage. And when supercharging, it's strength 8, AP minus 3, 2 damage. Right, so each roll. Of a 1, the bearer suffers one mortal wound after all the weapons shots have been resolved. Uh, again, it's a lot, lot better, in my opinion, than in the previous index. It used to be, when firing a, a plasma uh, weapons on the Leon Russ in general, if you rolled a 1, you would suffer 6 mortal wounds, Okay, and you cannot fire that weapon anymore. And so it made him really, really unreliable. But now, uh, it's just one mortal wound, according to this. And then we'll talk about the plasma vents in a minute. Then you've got the Exterminator Auto Cannon. So it's range 48, heavy 4, strength 7, AP minus 1, 2 damage. And the Exterminator Auto Cannon is. Where are you now? Exterminator Auto Cannon. You are somewhere. Come on. Where are you? An exterminator auto cannon is 25 points, which is pretty good. Heavy 4, strength 7, AB minus 1, 2 damage. Good. Heavy bolter, heavy flame, we know about. That's in the basic rules for 140,000. Uh, Laz cannon, we know about. Multi melter, which is the same. Now, sponson weapons and other weapons, including the pintle weapons, don't benefit from the grind advance if moving. You have to bear that in mind. But it's only minus one, so sponsor weapons are great. And the great thing about 8th edition is that they've made uh, the clarification for weapons so much more better and less complicated, which is a really good fix. Uh, plasma cannon, so we know the rules of plasma cannon. Punisher Gatling Gunner, so it's range 24, heavy 20. Okay, but remember, grind advance and under half move, it's heavy 40. 40 shots at strength 5, AP minus 0, uh, 1 damage, but pumping a load of shots. And the Punisher Gatling Cannon is. Where are you? Du -du 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 gun. Here we go. Punisher Gatling Gun is 20 points. 20 points for 40 shots. Yeah, it's good. Then you got the Vanquisher Battle Cannon. Remember? Not heavy one if you're doing under half move, it's heavy two. Range 72, it's got good range. Strength 8, AP minus 3, D6 damage. Roll two dice when inflicting the damage with this weapon and discard the lowest result. So it's an anti tank weapon. Superb anti tank weapon. And the Vanquisher um, Battle Cannon is 25 points. Which is really good. And uh, weapons options, so this model replaces battle cannon, exterminate all cannon, blah blah blah, which we explained. Uh, model may replace its heavy bolter with the last cannon. Uh, this model may take two heavy bolters and two heavy flames and two multi or two plasma cannons. Those are the sponsor weapons. 
This model may take items from the vehicle equipment list. Okay, so special rules or abilities. Grind advance, see page 86, which we explained. Uh, explodes. So if it's destroyed, which is quite commonly does, if this model is reduced to zero roads on a roll of a d6 before removing it from the battlefield, on a roll of a 6 it explodes and each unit within 6 suffers d3 mortal wounds. So don't let it explode, whatever you do. And basically don't get it killed. <laughs> Uh, but you can spend a command point to re-roll it if you do and haven't spent it. Uh, right, smoke launchers. Once per game, instead of shooting any weapons in the shooting phase, this model can use its smoke launchers until the end of your next shooting phase. Your opponent must subtract one from all hit rolls for ranged weapons that target the vehicle. So if you don't want to shoot, activate smoke. can be very handy. Tank orders. This has changed considerably for the benefit and for much much better realism in my opinion. Uh, tank orders. This model can issue one order each turn your friendly regiment Lehman Russ at the start of the shooting phase. To issue a tank order pick a Lehman Russ, so it's the keyword, within six of this model and choose which order you wish to issue from the table to the right. Each Lehman Russ can only be given a single order each turn. Now, the big change here is that in the index and in previous editions, a tank commander cannot issue an order to himself, which it, in my opinion is very unrealistic because a Lehman Russ, according to law, has a crew value of six, six crew members, and if he has no sponsors, as a crew of four. So what didn't make sense was the commander not issuing orders to his crew, you see. Uh, because it said in the index version, you have to read this very carefully, I had this trouble on Facebook. Uh, I was like, oh, why does it say you can't issue orders to yourself? But I looked at the wrong book. I searched on the web. You have to look at the codex. That's, my, that's what you have to learn. So it says here in the... In the um, Index, if you look at the index, it says that you can issue an order, but you cannot issue an order to a character. But if you look here, keywords, it has a character. Tank Command has a character. But what they've done is they deleted that sentence. So as long as you're within the aurora of discipline, within six inches of Lehman Russ, you can issue orders to another tank, including yourself. So that solves all the problem because. The codex overrules the previous FAQs and the index. Okay, and thank the emperor, it has been fixed. Because <laughs> tank commanders are awesome; they are key to winning battles, in my opinion. Tank commanders are brilliant, and not only that, they're an HQ choice as well. So you can uh, do it. You can. They can be your warlord, for example, which is absolutely superb. And one of the other improvements as well is the emergency plasma vents. If this model fires supercharged plasma cannon, and if you roll one or more hit rolls of one, it is not automatically destroyed. Instead, for each hit of a roll of one, the bearer suffers one mortal wound after all the weapons shots have been resolved. So again, it makes uh, executioners much more reliable, and it's, so it should be. I think it's. I think otherwise they would never dare to go into a plasma executioner in real life if that was the case. So, tank orders. So, here we go. Full throttle. Instead of shooting this phase, the ordered model immediately moves as if it were the movement phase. It must advance as part of this move and cannot declare charge during the turn. So, if you don't want to shoot, you want to get to an objective, like for example the spearhead. A formation which you can score points now. Uh, you can just go full throttle, but you must advance, you can't charge, which is fantastic. Gunners kill on sight. Reroll hit rolls or one for the ordered model until the end of the phase. Very handy. That's for all Lima Russes, all regiments. This is for all the uh, regiments you can issue that order to. Strike and Shroud. This order can only be issued to a model that has not yet used its smoke launchers during the battle. The ordered model can shoot its weapons and launch its smoke launchers during this 
phase. Again, it is very handy. So you fire all your guns, and if you're if you're like going to be hit by like heavy caliber weapons, minus one to hit with smoke. It's very powerful. So that's all the rules for tank commander. Uh, pretty much the same for knight commander pask, but there are some extra bonuses as well. So. Uh, Knight Commander Pask is Ballistic Skill 2+. Plus. That's right, Ballistic Skill 2+. Plus. He is superb. And when issuing order to himself, he can reroll ones. That's right, he can reroll ones to hit because gunners kill on sight order. Even if he's moved, which is fantastic. And with Grind of Arts as well. He's very, very powerful now. So all the uh, rules of the weapons we've been through. And his Lehman Russ is called Hand of Steel. Just to let you know the name of the Russ. Anything unique? Knight Commander. So, Knight Commander rule. So, Knight Commander Pass can, may use the Tank's Order ability twice in each of your turns. Resolve the effects of your order before issuing the second order. Which is very powerful. You can issue additional order. And Knight Commander Pass costs... How many points does he cost? He costs... He's probably quite expensive. Knight Commander Pask, name characters. Uh, 177 points. That includes... Does that include upgrades? Does not include war gear. So that's fair enough. So you have to pay for the war gear which we've been through. So that's his unique abilities, that's Knight Commander Pask. Now, we're going to go to Commissar Yarrick. Commissar Yarrick, movement 6, weapon skill 2+, plus, ballistic skill 2+, plus, strength 3, toughness 4, wounds 4, attacks 3, leadership 9, save 4+. Plus. <coughs> now, um, what's unique about Yarrick? Yarrick is famed for the Bailei. Uh, rate 6, pistol 1, strength 3, AP... Minus two, one damage. So it's kind of like a hot shot les pistol. Uh, bolt pistol. He has storm bolter, which we know. Power claw. This is basically an orc's power claw, from which he took from the war boss that he slew after he lost his arm. Hence, he's got the power claw. So it's melee, melee strength times two, AP minus three, D three damage. When attacking with this weapon, you must subtract one to hit roll. That's fair enough because orc uh, weaponry and forgery in general is very crude and rough and not very well built. Uh, so it's good that they kept the minus one to there. Aurora of Discipline, Astra Militarum units within six of a friendly Commissar can use the Commissar's leadership instead of their own. Iron Will. Roll a d6 each time Commissar Yarrick loses his final wound. On a roll of a 3 plus, that wound is not lost, so he's very resilient and he can withstand a lot of punishment. Power Field. Commissar Yarrick has a 4 plus invulnerable save. Hero of Hades Hive. You can re roll hit rolls of 1 made for friendly Astra Militarum units within 6 of Commissar Yarrick. You may re-roll any failed hit rolls for Commissar, uh, so for friendly Astra Militarum units within six of Commissar Yarrick when attacking Orc units. So, Yarrick is pretty amazing in close combat as well as his ability within six inches, especially against Orcs. So he's hitting with a power fist and three plus re-rolls. And if, even if it's not against Orcs, it's still that re-rolls of one is very handy. Uh, it's a very powerful ability actually and Commissar Yarrick is costs 130 points including war gear which is very handy. Uh, summary execution uh, Astra, uh, Astra Militarum units are in six of a friendly Commissar can never lose more than one model as a result of a single failed morale test. Very very handy for morale Especially if men are taking heavy casualties, you'll just take one model off, regardless. Because the fear of the Commissar overrides the fear of the enemy, so they think. Okay, uh, Lord Commissar. 
is power level 4. Yarrick is power level 7, which is interesting. So, Lord Commissar is power level 4. And Lord Commissar. Lord Commissar, where are you? Here we go. Lord Commissar is 50 points. Does not include war gear. So, uh, he is equipped. Lord Commissar is a model equipped with bolt pistol and power sword. So, he's moving 6, weapon skill 2+, plus, position skill 2+, plus, strength 3, toughness 3, wounds 4, attacks 3, leadership 9, save 4+. Plus. It's very good. Stat lines for a guardsman. Uh, a roar of discipline. Astra military units within 6 of the Commissar. Use the leadership instead of their own. Tractor field, 5 weapon 1. And summary execution, like we've been through. He's, cool, he's very cool HQ. He's cheap. He's quite good in close combat, especially with a power sword. And giving him a relic and all that could be very, very useful. So, Lord Commissar, he is good. Colonel Ironhand Strachan, he is a named character. And he costs 75 points, including war gear. He's power level of 4. He's movement 6, weapon skill 2 plus, ballistic skill 3 plus, strength 6, toughness 4, wounds 5. That's right, he's got 5 wounds, that's pretty hard. Uh, attacks 4, leadership 9, save 3 plus. He's got 5 wounds for a guardsman, that's pretty good. You have to bear that in mind. Uh, he is equipped with um, power level 4, iron hands track, and is a single model armed with a plasma pistol, shotgun, frag grenades, crack grenades, and bionic arm with devil's claw. Only one of this model may be included in your army. So that's fair enough. So, plasma pistol he's got, we know the rules for that. Shotgun, which is kind of unique, I'll read it out to you. So it's strength, uh, so it's range 12, assault 2, so it can fire on the move, even if it's advanced, but minus 1 ballistic skill. Uh, strength 3, AP 0, 1 damage. If the target is half a range, add one to its weapon strength. It's very useful, very realistic and useful. Which a shotgun would. Uh, bionic arm with devil's claw. So it's melee, melee. Strength user, AP minus one to damage. Not quite as good as previous editions in my opinion. It's only AP minus one. And he's strength six though, which is quite high. Uh, frag grenade. And crack grenades he's got. So, he has the voice of command ability. See page 85. Actually, I think he can only issue, if you look back here, company commander, voice of command. Oh, that's right. So he, do, he does, he can issue two orders. That's cool. Uh, been there, been there, see it, kill it. You can re or failed wound rolls made for Colonel Ahana Strachan in the fight phase when attacking enemy monsters. Nice. Uh, Refactor Field. Colonel Ahana Strachan has a 5 plus and vulnerable save. Cold Steel and Courage. All models in the friendly Kachan units are in 6 of Colonel Ironhand Strachan at the start of the fight phase can make one additional attack each time they fight during that phase. Pretty handy. Especially on the charge. Uh, senior officer. Colonel Ironhand Strachan may use the voice of command ability twice. In each of your turns, resolve the effects of the first order before issuing the second order. Very good. He's a cool character. Catchans love him. Catchan players adore him. He's a cool character. Uh, right, we've got the Tempestus Prime. So, looking at the Stormtroopers. He's the elite Imperial Guardsman. So he has a movement characteristic of 6. So, before we do so, he's power level 3. And the Tempest of Prime costs 65 points. A bit expensive. Does not include war gear. Uh, weapons skill 3+, plus, ballistic skill 3+, plus, strength 3, toughness 3, wounds 4, attacks 3, leadership 8, save 4+. Uh, bolt Pistol. Range 12, pistol 1, strength 4, AP 0, damage 1. We know about that. Hot shot less pistol we've been through. Press pistol chainsaw, frag crack grenades. And then we've got here abilities. Tempestuous command rod. Model with a tempestuous command. Tempestuous command rod. 
may use the voice of command ability twice in each of your turns resolve the effects of the first order before issuing the second order now does that cost points does he come with a standard no he doesn't so tempestus command rod uh, other war gear tempestus command rod is zero points that's very handy so it costs no points for having that upgrade so you can issue two orders, you can issue it twice. Aerial drop. During deployment you can set up this model in high altitude transport ready to deploy via GraphQt. Instead of placing it on the battlefield at the end of your movement phases, the model can make an aerial drop. So set it up anywhere on the battlefield that is more than 9 away from any enemy models very very handy ability that is so you can come in and deep strike an ambush position which is what they're famed for Primaris Psyker they're on to Psykers now Primaris Psyker is the leader of the psychic uh, regimental organization whatever you call it so Primaris Psyker is power level 2 and he costs Primary Psyker is he's cheap, he's 28 points, not including war gear. Okay, weapons, uh, weapons skill 3 plus, plus skill 3 plus, three, three toughness, 3 wounds, 4 attacks, 3 leadership, 8 save 5 plus. It's got quite a few attacks there, which is quite good. Uh, unique weapons uh, Force Stave, melee, melee, strength plus 2, AP minus 1, D3, because that represents a force weapon. Primary Psyker is armed with a model armed with a LAS pistol for stave. So, for stave. For stave. If the for stave is 12 points, so you've got to add that because this does not include war gear. So it's 12 points, which is fair enough. And okay, so abilities. It's for your own good. If this model is slain as a result of the power of the warp whilst within six of a friendly commissar they are not executed before anything untoward can happen the power that they were tempting, tempting still fails but units within six of them do not suffer the d3 mortal wounds as normal so that's quite handy so puts them out of their misery saves a lot of trouble and uh, yes psycho this model can attempt to manifest one psychic power in each friendly psychic phase and attempt to deny one psychic power in each enemy psychic phase. It knows the smite power and knows psychic powers from the Persanica discipline. Uh, that's it. Yep. Cool. He's quite handy. I, I do like him. He's very good. Here we go. The basic infantry squad. Right. So, the basic infantry guardsmen. So I'll read out the stats. Power level 3. It's pretty high actually, but still they are effective in numerous numbers. Movement 6, weapon skill 4+, plus, ballistic skill 4+, plus, strength 3, toughness 3, wounds 1, attacks 1, leadership 6, save 5+, plus. leadership value of 6 is pretty low. Uh, sergeant makes them leadership of 7, plus 1 attack as well. And for heavy weapons team the only change is there. If you wanted to purchase them, uh, you would have to. It's only two boons and two attacks because there's two humans manning a heavy weapon. Okay, it contains one sergeant and nine guardsmen. Each guardsman is armed with a las gun and threk grenades. The sergeant is armed with a las pistol and threk grenades. And it's interesting that it's not mentioned a chainsword. So, how much is a chainsword? I think it's zero points. Chainsword is zero points, so he gets that standard for free. And then we know the rules for the main weapons, but for purposes of uh, new players, a las gun is the most common weapon of the Imperial Guard. They've made hundreds of trillions of these weapons, probably, knowing the size of the Imperium. So, las guns, either range 24, heavy, uh, sorry, rapid fire 1. Strength 3, AP 0, damage 1. Okay, it's not that great as a stat line, but it's lots of shots. That's what they rely upon. Lots of cheap shots grabbing a kill. That's what they rely upon. It's a good 
all-round weapon, technically speaking. It's just, they just make manufacture tons of them. Okay, any abilities? So, with a guardsman, one guardsman may take a Vox Caster, which is what I do regularly, because it's very handy for communications and orders. A Vox Caster costs five points. Uh, two other guardsmen may have from heavy weapons team. You must take the item from the heavy weapons list. So, if we look at the heavy weapons list, uh, where are we now? Heavy weapons, ranged weapons. So, you've got the mortar. M for mortar is five points. Then you've got a missile launcher, it's 20 points. Then you've got the auto cannon, which is 15 points. Heavy bolter is 8 points, and a las cannon is 20 points. So that's what weapons they can take for the Imperial Guard infantry squad. Next. Uh, one other guardsman may replace his las gun and the item of the special weapons list. So, special weapons. So he can take, let's start with the uh, grenade launcher, which is the most common weapon that the Cadians would use. Uh, grenade launcher is five points. It's cheap, it's good, it's very reliable. I do take them. For five points. If you're doing ultra competitive, maybe not, but I prefer playing it by fluff and law based games, so I always take a grenade launcher with my squad. And the next weapon would be a long las or a sniper rifle. Sniper rifle is two points, so that's very cheap. Sniper rifle, and then you've got what's next? You've got the flamer. Flamer is seven points. Uh, plasma gun. Plasma gun is 13 points. That's quite expensive. I think it's more expensive actually. One of them bits is more expensive. Melter gun. M for melter. Melter gun costs 12 points. The same. Are there any other weapons? No, nope, I think I've covered them. So. That's how much they cost. You add that on top of the infantry squad. Uh, the sergeant replaced their last pistol with the item of the ranged list. So, ranged list. The sergeant may replace their last pistol with an item from the ranged weapons list. Hmm, okay, uh, ranged weapons list. So he can take. That's enough. Can he take a plasma pistol or a bolt pistol? A regular sergeant. I know veteran sergeants can. But to be on the safe side, I'm just going to presume that you can't. But it says you can. Range list is. That's different. I think that's changed. Uh, yeah. Hmm. That got me thinking now. <laughs> yeah, the sergeant may replace their las pistol with an item with the ranged list, weapons list. Hmm. So, it looks like I can take plasma pistols and bolt pistols. But I probably won't though, because in my opinion there's really no point in the way. If you're doing a... a like a power level game, yes, but for match play, no. Not in my opinion. So, uh, right. So I'm going to replace and take a chainsaw or a power sword. And a power sword, so the only point is a power sword. A power sword costs you four points for a power sword. That's very, very handy. Uh, they're really good. That's really cheap. Towels used to be very expensive, but now they're really good. Okay. Okay. 
Conscripts, this is one of the units that has gone worse, but for the better in my opinion, being more realistic. So the stats line for a Conscript is movement 6, weapon skill 5+, plus, ballista skill 5+, plus, strength 3, toughness 3, wounds 1, attacks 1, leadership 4, very poor, 4 for being very poor, uh, save 5+, plus. okay, power level 3, but this unit contains 20 conscripts and can include up to 10 additional conscripts, power rating of plus 1. Each conscript is armed with a las gun and frag grenades. Now, in previous editions, I think it was in 4th in edition and before, conscripts used to only be in, you have to take units of 20. Then they changed that in 5th edition so that they can add 20 to 50. Uh, conscripts in the unit. 50 conscripts. That's crazy. So a lot of guardsmen would do the meat shield tactic, like just send the conscripts to like stop the charges, absorb all the charging. Okay, they get cut to pieces, but they absorb all the damage, so to speak. And then, and uh, now, it's uh, you can take up to 30, which is a nice number in my opinion, especially the way I lay out my regiment, I like it in threes. It's like squadrons of three are tanks, squadrons of three and a platoon, but this is a three here, and then for veterans I'd have three veteran squads in per company, which fits very, very well. Three is a nice number for the Imperial Guard. So, thirty and threes, they're good. So I'm happy with that change. And another change that they've done is they've done the special rule called Raw Recruits. Uh, roll a d6 each time an officer issues an, uh, the voice of command ability to issue an order to this unit. On a 4+, plus, the order applies as normal. Otherwise, the order has no effect and no other orders can be issued to this unit for the rest of this turn. Uh, yeah, I think this rule is good because it makes conscripts much more unreliable, which is what they should be. They are nervous, terrified wretches, and they have little experience in combat, they're reluctant, they don't want to fight, they're just basically recruited, a force recruitment, so to speak. So yeah, they have to fight, they don't want to fight with the Imperium, so hence they'll be always called conscripts. Cadians call them white shields, hence for their distinctive white crest on the top of their helmet. So, conscripts, would I take conscripts still? Yes, for a meat shield. I'm going to use them more aggressively now and just, just stick them out in the open. Because in previous edition I put them in cover and they didn't do anything, they just caught up. And in 8th edition I've been using them more so they're more up front. So that's what I'm going to do, try and do for now when deploying them. Melatarum Tempestus. We've been basically we've been through all the rules for the Tempestus Prime, but there are some, some unique weapons. So, a Militarum Tempestus Scions. Uh, power level three, and he costs uh, Scions is nine points per man. Does not include war gear. So. Uh, Tempestus uh, Prime or Scion is movement 6, weapon skill 4 plus, ballistic skill 3 plus. These are like the elite of the elite of the Imperial Guard. Strength 3, toughness 3, wounds 1, attacks 1, leadership 6, save 4 plus. And then Tempestus Prime is the same except he's got 2 attacks and leadership is plus 1. And right, this unit contains 1 Tempestus Prime and 4 Tempestus Scions. It can include up to 5 additional Tempestus Scions, power rating of plus 2. Each Tempestus Scion is armed with a hotshot las gun. Frag and crack grenades. So a hot shot las gun. Hot shot las gun costs you one point. So you have to take them. They cost at one point. So technically they are ten points each. Alright. The Tempest is armed with a hot shot las pistol, chain sword. Frag grenades and a Tempestus last pistol probably costs one point. Uh, Tempestus 
pistol. Hot shot less pistol is one point as well. Okay, went through all the uh, points cost for the standard weapons, melted gun, grenade launcher, uh, plasma gun, etc. But there are some unique weapons. So, the hot shot volley gun is range 24, heavy 4, strength 4, AP minus 2, 2 damage. And a hot shot volley gun costs you 6 points. That's pretty good, actually, for AP minus 2 weapon. 4 shots, good ballistic skill. Uh, on the move, it'd be a minus one to hit, but it's okay. It's a good weapon. I plan to do a uh, platoon of scions. I've just got to paint them, try and get them done. Uh, the fluff behind these, just to let you know, is they the the regiment that I've chosen or the platoon I've chosen are I think they are the something seventy second hydras, which if you read the law behind them. Uh, they have close ties to the Ultramarines. And the good thing about the vehicles is that I can camouflage the vehicles exactly the same as my current Imperial Guard. Because they like to blend in the camouflage with the local environment. So, hence there'll be grey camouflage Toroxes. Which is fantastic. And it fits perfectly to the fluff. Which is perfect. Really, really happy with that. So that's the regiment I've chosen. And the colour scheme is like the red and the Laz guns are kind of like a white grey colour and the cloth, would you believe, uh, the clothing is grey just like the Imperial Guard which is very very cool which is really cool, I'm really really happy about that so I'm, I'm actually really looking forward to doing my own to Pestis Science, I'm hopefully doing a platoon them in support of the regiment and they'll have their own regimental doctrine so <clears throat> now I explained earlier on uh, how many points the Voxcaster is, but what does the Voxcaster do? So I'm about to tell you. So the Voxcaster, if a friendly officer within three of a unit where the Voxcaster is using the Voicer Command ability, you may extend the range of the order to 18. If the target unit also contains a Voxcaster. So, yeah, that is very, very handy. So. For example, you have an officer that is within three of a Voxcaster, and you can issue an order to units with another Voxcaster of 18, which is very, very handy. So I do take Voxcasters in every squad, which is very powerful. So, here we go. Master of Ordnance. Boom to six. Weapon skill four plus, plus skill three plus. Strength 3, toughness 3, wounds 3, attacks 2, leadership 6, save 5 plus, and a master ordinance power level 2, and he costs 30 points. Artillery barrage. Okay, so a master of ordinance is a single mortar armed with a less pistol than artillery barrage. So here we go. Artillery barrage is range 100, heavy d6, strength 8, AP minus 2, d3 damage. This weapon can only be fired once per battle and cannot be used if the bearer moves. This weapon can target units that are not visible to the bearer when doing so. Subtract one two from the hit rolls. Uh, you may only use one artillery barrage per turn, regardless of how many Masters of Ordnance you have in your army, which is fair enough. Otherwise, you just give a whole army of Masters of Ordnance and can be a nightmare. <laughs> and their characters as well. So hard to shoot at. Master of Ballistics. And uh, Master of Ballistics, you can re-roll any hit rolls of one made by friendly regiment basilisks, weverens, manticores, or death strikes when they target enemy units over 36 away in the shooting phase if they are within six of this model. Very handy for artillery. Which is very, very handy. So I do have him painted. I may have to try him out in the new edition. Platoon Commander. Basically it's the lower tier of the company commander. Uh, a platoon commander would usually be the ranking system for him, if you're doing by British Army Standard, which is what I based my Imperial Guard on, the rank, the ranking system. Hence I, the reason why I've done it is because I come from Britain, obviously, England. 
and he would be a warrant officer, be in charge of a section. And then, for company command, he would be a lieutenant colonel, he would be in charge of the uh, company. And then in charge of a regiment would usually be a general. So it depends on who's taking casualties and that kind of thing. So, command squad. Actually, I haven't looked to the rules for platoon commander. Begging your pardon, went too fast there. Voice to command, refractor field, 5 plus invulnerable save. He has three wounds. Uh, weapon skill 3 plus, ballistic skill 3 plus, strength 3, toughness 3, attacks 3. Uh, leadership 7, save 5 plus. Yep, you can take weapons, weapon melee list, it's nice. Cool, yep, happy with that. Yeah, platoon commander. I do take platoon commanders. They are good at, they're actually very good at flanking. So if you have a single unit, keep a platoon commander behind them, issue load of orders, move, 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 blah, blah, all that. Force of the Emperor, that's another great order to do. It's actually very handy to have them. So if you don't want your warlord dead, for example, uh, platoon commanders are great, and they're cheap. And a platoon commander will cost you 20 points. Very cheap. So, over here, command squad. So, command squad. Now, they've changed this a little bit uh, since the index came out. So, there used to be platoon command squad and company command squad. Platoon command squad is basically the regular guardsmen, but now all types of platoon commanders and company command squads are veterans. Hence, they changed the sets. They made them better. So, a veteran. Uh, in the command squad. is movement 6, weapon skill 4+, plus, plus skill 3+. Plus. They're good at shooting. Strength 3, toughness 3, wins 1, attacks 1, leadership 6, 0, 5 plus. Uh, Veteran, heavy weapons teams the same. It's got 2 wounds, 2 attacks. And, right, here we go. So, unique uh, equipment. So, a medipack. A medipack will cost you 10 points. Medipack. At the end of, the, of any of your movement phases, a model with a medipack can attempt to heal a single model. Select a friendly Astro Militarum infantry unit within three and roll a d6. On a roll of four plus, one model in the unit recovers a wound it lost earlier in the battle. If the unit has a wounds characteristic of one, one model is slain earlier in the battle is returned to the unit instead. A unit can only be the target of this ability once each turn. Uh, so medics are handy, keep them near a character if he's taken wounds, so you can heal them. And another thing as well, you can fall back in combat, you can't advance when falling back in combat, but don't say that you can't heal people when falling back from combat, so you can do that. So you still, you still can use that ability. Okay, regimental standard. Regimental standard, that will cost you... Hmm, where are you? Regimental standard. R. Are you there? Regimental standard? Where are you? Wolf in you. Just trying to find you. Regimental standard. Oh, there we go. Regimental standard is five points. It's pretty cheap, actually. It's pretty good. Regimental standard, all friendly regiment units add one to the leadership whilst they are within six of any regiment, veteran or regimental standard. Which is very, very good. Voxcaster. If a friendly officer is within three of the unit, which we've already been through, so you can take Voxcasters and their command squad. Very handy. Here we go. Colour Sergeant Kell. Power level of three. And Colour Sergeant Kell is a named character. He costs you 50 points. He's a little bit expensive, but that does include war gear. But what does he do? He's movement 6, weapon skill 3 plus, plus skill 3 plus, strength 3, toughness 3, 4 wounds, attacks 3, leadership 7, save 4 plus. Uh, Color Sergeant Kell is a single arm model armed with a last pistol, power fist, and power sword, so he's armed to the teeth. Only one of this model may be included in your army. Fair enough. Uh, right, last pistol, power fist, power sword, we know the rules for. Nothing that's unique about that. Colours of the Cadian 8th. Friendly Cadian units within 6 of Colour Sergeant Kell may 
Reroll failed morale tests. That's pretty good. Uh, listen up, maggots. Uh, you can make one additional order with a single friendly Cadian officer, and then six of Color Sergeant Kell in each of your turns. Very, very handy. That means uh, you can make. That means if you stick him with Creed, Creed can issue four orders. Nice. And there's why he hangs around a Creed. Sworn Protector. Roll a d6 each time Lord Castellan Creed loses a wound whilst he's in three of Color Sergeant Gell. On a 2 plus, Lord Castellan Creed does not lose a wound, but Color Sergeant Gell suffers a mortal wound. So he's a Sworn Protector. Special Weapons Squad. Power level 2. Uh, power Special Weapons Squad. Six Guardsmen. Now, how many points is a Guardsman? A Guardsman will cost you Guardsman or Infantry Squad. Actually, you're a Special Weapons Squad, aren't you? S for Special Weapons. Six points. Six points per unit. And per model is four points. Four points. Uh, basically, this is a six man team. Uh, pretty much the same layout as the Imperial Guard in terms of equipment, but their squad size is reduced to six. However, you can take th uh, three models, must replace their LAS gun with the item listed for special weapons list. So, we've already been through that. The special weapons list, like flamers, plasmas, Snipers, demo, uh, demolition charges, and we'll look at demolition charges now. Demolition charges, demo charge. Is there a demo charge here? Uh, ba -ba -ba, here we go. No, that's not there. Where are you? Demo charge. Demo charge. Demolition charge? No, I don't think it's on here. No. That's odd. Where are you? Demo charge. Demo charge. Maybe it's not in here. We'll find it out later. You can find it out. You can find it out when you get this codex. So I won't go through that unless I find it as I go through. Never mind. Uh, veterans. A veteran will cost you units. V for veterans. Veterans will cost you uh, models per unit is 10, 6 points. So they're quite cheap. Power level 5. Uh, they're basically the same as a command squad when it comes to stats. Uh, they're good at shooting. They're blitz skill 3 plus and d6. So, what's unique about these? So, this unit contains one veteran sergeant and nine veterans. Each veteran is armed with a las gun frick grenades. The veteran sergeants armed with a lance pistol and great grenades. So here's the options that are big, the big changes. Uh, any veteran may have placed their las gun with a, sh with a shotgun or an auto gun. Now las guns are more common than auto guns because they're more easier to manufacture than auto guns. So I won't probably go. D I probably won't go down the auto gun route. But from Forge World, they do a veteran unit that has shotguns, so I do have a unit of 10 of those, but not many. Uh, one veteran may take a Voxcaster, one other veteran may place their LAS gun with a heavy flamer. Two other veterans from a veteran heavy weapons team who must take an item from the heavy weapons list. Up to three other veterans may replace their LAS gun with an item of the special weapons list. Three. That's very handy. Uh, the veteran sergeant may take a chain sword and item of the melee's weapons list. A veteran sergeant may place the last pistol with from the weapon, uh, range list. It's very nice. Good. Lots of options for weapons. So you can have a heavy flamer and two melters, three plasmas, three melters, three sniper rifles, and including a heavy weapons team as well in one squad. Lots of firepower. Sergeant Harker, power level 3. Harker is a named character and he's 50 points. So, 
Harker is movement 6, weapon skill 3+, plus, ballistic skill 3+, plus, strength 3, toughness 3, wounds 3. Sorry, strength 4, toughness 3, wounds 3, attacks 4. Leadership 7, save 5+. Plus. Sergeant Harker is a single model armed with the payback, frag grenades and crack grenades. Crack grenades as well, which is good. Only one of this model may take me to include your army. So, what's unique about Harker? Payback. Payback is range 36, assault 3, strength 5, AP minus 2, 1 damage. He is a guy that likes to use his heavy bolter. He's very, very cool actually. Very, very p powerful heavy bolter. And he can, that means he can move at minus 1 ballistic skill, even if he's advanced, which is pretty handy. Uh, what's unique about him? Alright, here you go. Harker's Hellraisers. You can re-roll hit rolls of a 1 in the shooting phase for friendly Kachan units within 6 of Sergeant Harker. Very cool. Minotaurus Tempestus Command Squad. Command Squad. Minotaurus Tempestus Command Squad is 9 points per model. He is expensive. Um. Pretty much the same as the uh, Tempestus Prime when it comes to equipment, medipack, platoon standard, which have already been through, aerial drop, which have already been through. Um, in a storm, priest, parallel two, he costs M for Ministorum Priest. Ministorum Priests will cost you 35. 35 points. Weapon, uh, movement 6, weapon skill 4+, plus, plus skill 4+, plus, strength 3, toughness 3, wounds 4, attacks 3, leash at 9, save 6+. plus. Uh, any unique weapons? No. He has an auto gun though, which is unique. Which is the same as a las gun, range 24, rapid fire 1, strength 3, AP 0, uh, 1 damage. Alright. Abilities, Zealot. You can reroll fails hit rolls for this unit in a turn in which it charged, made a, in which the unit charged, in which the heroic intervention was charged by an enemy unit. Very handy. Ulzarius. He has a 4 plus invulnerable save. War Hymns. You can add one to the attack's characteristic of all models in the Adeptus Ministorum infantry and Astra Militarum infantry units within six of any friendly. Ministorum priests. Very powerful. Crusaders. The Crusader. Power level 2. And he costs uh, 11 points. You can have 2 to 10 in a unit. Okay, Crusader is boot 6, weapon skill 3 plus, bliss skill 4 plus, strength 3, toughness 3, wounds 1, attacks 2, leadership 7, save 4 plus. Uh, this unit contains two Crusaders. It may contain up to two additional Crusaders, power rating plus one, up to four additional Crusaders, power rating of plus two, up to six additional uh, Crusaders, power rating of three plus, up to eight additional Crusaders of four plus. Each Crusader is armed with a power sword. It's very handy. Power sword you have to pay the points for, which is I think is only four points. Okay. So we don't know the rules for the power sword. So, abilities. Acts of Faith. Uh, roll a d6 at the start of each of your turns and revolve a 2 plus. One unit from your army with disability can perform the act of faith chosen from the following list. So here we go. Hand of the Emperor. The unit can immediately move as if it was the moon phase. Okay. Divine Guidance. The unit can immediately shoot as if it were the shooting phase. <laughs> the Passion. The unit can, if it is in one of an enemy unit, immediately pile in and attack as if it were the fight phase. The Spirit of the Martyr. One model in the unit recovers D3 lost wounds, or you can return a single slain model to the unit within one rune remaining. That's actually pretty powerful. Do you know what? I feel like getting Crusaders. They're actually quite cool, actually. I like them. A lot of rules as well. And they're quite cheap. Shield of Faith. Models in this unit have a 6 plus invulnerable save. In addition, this unit can attempt to deny one psychic power in each of the psychic phase. And the same manner as a Psyker. However, it 
does so, instead of rolling 2d6, I need to roll a single d6. The psychic power is resi resisted to the roll that is greater than the result in the psychic test that is manifested the power. When attempting to deny a psychic power, first select a uh, a model in a unit, measure range, visibility, etc. from the model. So, yeah, I think it's pretty handy. Zealot. As we've been through the same rules for the Storm Priest, Storm Shield uh, models um, in this unit have a free plus and vulnerable save. So, a Storm Shield. S for Storm Shield. Unique weapons. I think it'll be under. Would it be under here? S for Storm Shield. Melee weapons. Uh, other war gear. Storm shield, slab shield. I can't find it. No, it's not here. Storm shield. S for storm shield. No. No, I can't find it. Okay. Maybe it's... No, that's a bit strange. Okay, uh, never mind. I'll have to try and find that at some other time. It doesn't give you the points there, it's a shame. A couple of bits missing. Not to worry. Uh, right, so, Tech Priest Engine Seer, power level 2, and he costs you... 30 points, not including war gear. Um, okay. Tech Priest Engine Seer is movement 6, weapon skill 4+, plus, ballistic skill 4+, plus, strength 4, toughness 4, wounds 4, good amount of wounds actually. Attacks 2, leadership 8, save 3+. Plus. Uh, a Tech Priest is a single model armed with an Omnicide Axe, a Lance Pistol and a Servo Arm. Weapon. Weapon. Range. Uh, so, last piece we know about, Omnicide Axe is range melee, type melee, strength plus one, AP minus two, two damage, it's pretty good. Uh, servo Arm is uh, range melee, type melee, strength times two, AP minus two, flat three damage, that's very good. Uh, each Servo Arm can only be used to make one attack. Each time the model fights, when the model attacks with this weapon, you must subtract one to the hit roll. So you can only make one attack with this weapon, but still the free damage is pretty good. Bionics uh, abilities. So Bionics, he has a f 6 plus invulnerable save. Pretty handy. Uh, Master of the Machines. At the end of the movement phase, it's good for repairing vehicles, this type of unit. At the end of the movement phase, this model can repair a single friendly Forge World vehicle, Astro Militarum vehicle, or Cortisar Mechanicus. Model within three. If the model being repaired is Forge World or Astro Militarum model, it regains D3 loss wounds. And if it is a Cortisar Mechanicus model, it regains one loss wound. A model may not be the target of the Master of Mach uh, Machines ability more than once per turn. So you can only do it once per turn, but you can still recover wounds from the damage on the vehicles. Very handy. So, read out this footnote here. Designer's note. When selecting this unit for your army, choose which Forge World it will be from. This replaces the Forge World keyword in all instances and data sheet. Hmm. Okay. Uh, faction keywords. Cult Mechanicus Forge World. Okay. Servitors. Servitors are power level 3 and they will cost you 2 points per model. They're quite cheap actually. Servitor is movement 5, so it's a bit slow. Weapon skill 5 plus, bliss skill 5 plus, strength 3, toughness 3, wounds 1, attacks 1, leadership 6, save 4 plus. It's pro the reason why they're probably movement 5 is because they usually carry a lot of heavy equipment. For a human being standard. So, uh, bearing in mind they're like drones and that kind of thing. Heavy Bolter, which we know about, it's equipped with a multi-melter, plasma cannon, 
and servo arm, which we've already been through the rules for. This unit contains four servitors. Each servitor is armed with a servo arm. So there you go. That comes out as standard. Right. Okay. Abilities. Mine lock. Servitors can improve both their weapon skill and ballistic skill to 4+, plus and their leadership to 9, whilst they are within 6 of any friendly tick priests. Designer's note. Oh, well, I've been through that just now. Cool. That's servitors. Now, the standard commas are. Uh, power level 2. Commas are will cost you. He's an elite's choice. Commissar will cost you 30 points. Right, movement of 6, weapon skill 3 plus, ballistic skill 3 plus, strength 3, toughness 3, wounds 3, so they increased a wound now, which is good. Attacks 3, leash 8, save 5 plus. Uh, yep, yeah, that's improved there, the wounds compared to the last edition, but in the index they made it 3 uh, wounds. And a good amount of attacks actually, 3 attacks. Uh, right, so a Commissar is a single model armed with a bolt pistol. So basically he has all the rules. Uh, you can get access to the weapons list, so you can take a uh, plasma pistol, bolt pistol, power sword, power fist, power maul, that kind of thing. You can have access to all the similar rules that of the uh, Lord Commissar and Commissar Yarrick. Commissars are great for morale. I always take, I try to take a Commissar when I can. They are one of my favourite Imperial Guard characters. It's just something about them that just makes people laugh. <laughs> Even though they are viciously cruel when it comes to executing people without mercy. Okay, next here is Officer of the Fleet. Officer of the Fleet, he is an elite's choice. Officer of the Fleet is 25 points. Power level 2. Officer of the Fleet, movement 6, weapon skill 4, ballistic skill 3, plus strength 3, toughness 3, wounds 3, attacks 2, leadership 6, save 5, plus. Uh, Lance Pistol, he's equipped with. An officer is a. Officer of the Fleet is a single model armed with a Lance Pistol. Okay. Air Raid requested. Once per battle, in your shooting phase, you can pick an enemy unit other than a character that is visible to this model anywhere on the battlefield and then roll a d6 on a roll of a 1 to a 3 nothing happens on a roll of 5 to 6 the unit suffers d3 mortal wounds on a roll of a 6 the target suffers 3 mortal wounds you may only call one air raid per turn hmm you can do that per turn rather than the master of all you can do it once per battle that's interesting officer of the fleet's cool regards the number of officers of the fleet Regardless of the number of officers of the fleet, that's very different. Yeah, that's once per turn, or once per battle. Strafing con uh, co uh, coordinates. Strafing coordinates. I'll eventually get that right. Okay, at the start of the shooting phase, pick an enemy unit other than one which can fly within 18 of this model. For the duration of the phase, you can reroll hit rolls of one for any friendly astronaut imperialis units that can fly that target to the units you picked. So, like flyers and Valkyries and that kind of thing, that's actually very powerful for flyers. Okay, next is the... Weverden Psycho W. Weverden Psycho is 8 points. You can have up to 3 to 9 of them. So it's 9 points each. Uh, Weverden Psycho is moving 6, weapon skill 5, plus ballistic skill 4, plus strength 3, toughness 3, wounds 1, attacks 1, leadership 7. They've got good leadership actually. And a save of 6. plus. So. Um, this unit contains three Weaverland Psychers. It may, con may contain up to three additional Weaverland Psychers, power rating plus one, additional six Weaverland Psychers with power rating plus two. Each model is armed with a less pistol and Weaverland Stave. And a Weaverland Stave? Do you have to pay points for Weaverland Stave? 
Bowden Stave is zero points. It will cost you nothing. I'll keep that there as a footnote. So I'll keep that there. Saves a whole lot of time. Uh, right. And the Wyvern Stave is melee, range melee, type melee, strength plus one, AP zero, damage one. Okay. It's not bad, it's a strength four. Not the greatest, but they are fun nonetheless to use. Choir of Minds, each time you may take a psychic test, or deny the witch test for this unit, roll 1d6 instead of 2d6. You can add one to the psychic tests you make for this unit if it has three or more models, or two tests if it has six or more models. So, each time you take a psychic test or deny the witch test, Roll 1d6, so it's very hard to cast um, certain psychic powers. Yeah, very hard, and actually there's some you can't. Okay, that's interesting. You can never perils though, technically. Right, but if you have a Brotherhood of Sire, I suppose, yeah, it'd be good. Okay. Each unit can attempt to manifest a psychic power in each friendly psychic phase and attempt to deny one psychic power in each enemy psychic phase. It knows the smite power and one power from the Pasanica discipline. See page 137. Uh, when manifesting or denying a psychic power, first select a model of the unit. Measure range, visibility, etc. from the model. It suffers a peril of the warp and suffers D3 mortal wounds instead of described the core rules, but units within six only suffer damage if the Pearls of the Warp causes last model to be uh, manifest and units to be slain. Right, okay. So I think you still can Pearls. Can be a little bit complicated. I have to study them a bit more. I have used them. They are great fun to use. Okay, the Astropath. Right, the Astropath. Uh, <laughs> straight away I look at the power level. Power level 1. <laughs> it's great stuff. So the Astropath is 15 points. But he is cool. I like him. He's, he's very good actually at filling in the gaps for power level. So for example, if it's a power level 50 game and you've only got 49, the Astropath, you could fill him up. Just make up to 50. So, Astropath. Movement characteristic of 6, weapon skill 5 plus, plus skill 6 plus. Not very good at shooting. Uh, strength 3, toughness 3, wound 3. It's got 3 wounds. Attacks 1, leadership 6, save 6 plus. Uh, okay, an astropath is a single model armed with a telepathica stave. Now, a telepathica stave. A uh, telepathica stave is 6 points. So, it increases him to 21 points. But it's pretty good, actually. Despite the fact he's hitting on 5+. plus. Uh, strength plus 1, AP 0, D3 damage, though. It's the D3, it's pretty good. Uh, right. Uh, War gear. This moral may replace Telepathic Stave with a Laz pistol. But there's really no point. Um, Azrael uh, Divination. At the start of your shooting phase, pick an enemy uh, unit within 18 of that, this model for the duration of the phase. The unit you pick gains no bonus to their saving throws for being in cover when it is targeted by attacks made by friendly Astromilitarum units within 6 of this model. Uh, that's quite handy actually. Um, despite the fact he's not very good in close combat, the ability is pretty good for ignoring cover. Uh, telepathic Assault. Each time you take a psychic test for this unit, when he attempts to manifest Smite, roll 1d6 instead of 2d6. Uh, there's a bonus and a disadvantage here. Advantage and disadvantage. The advantage being he can never perils when casting Smite. Very handy. Uh, disadvantage. Very difficult casting Smite. So, very, very unlikely he'll do it. So, Warp charge value of 5, you need a 5 or a 6, so it's kind of unlikely border. It's not even chance, so I'd say unlikely. Very unlikely would be a 6 plus if he was warp charge 6. So it's unlikely he would cast smite. 
I used that in previous games and he didn't cast smite at all. But when he does, uh, three mortal wounds, uh, potential, not bad. Uh, psychic power, uh, he's a psyker. So this model can attempt to manifest one psychic power in each friendly psychic phase and attempt to deny one psychic power in each of the enemy psychic phase. It knows the smite and one power from the Persanica discipline. Interesting. So, a new unit is Ogrin Bodyguard. This is new in the Codex. He's power level 4. Ogrin Bodyguard. Um, he is 55 points. 55 points he is. Uh, movement 6, weapon skill 3 plus, ballistic plus skill 4 plus, strength 5, toughness 5, 6 wounds. He's pretty hard. Attacks 4, leadership 8, save 5 plus. An Ogrim bodyguard is a single model armed with a ripper gun and a huge knife and frag and crack bombs. So, Grenadier Gauntlet. So, how many points is a Grenadier Gauntlet? Uh, G for Grenadier Gauntlet. <coughs> Grenadier Gauntlet. He will cost you 10 points. Grenadier Gauntlet is range 12. Assault D6, strength 4, AP 0, damage 1. Ripper Gun, shooting. So, Ripper Gun. R for Ripper. For shooting. Ripper Gun. Is it a melee weapon? Nope. Ripper gun. Where are you? Ripper gun, ripper gun. Ah, here we go. Zero points. It costs nothing. Uh, right. So, ripper gun for shooting is range 12, assault 3, strength 5, AP 0, damage 1. Uh, ripper gun in melee is melee melee, strength user, AP minus 1, 1 damage. So that's pretty good for a 0 point upgrade. And then you've got a Bulgrin Maul. Bulgrin Maul. Uh, melee weapon. 7 points. Bulgrin Maul is melee, melee, strength plus 2, AP minus 1, 2 damage. It's pretty good. Bulgrin Maul, 7 points. That's pretty good for 7 points. Huge knife. H for huge knife is zero points again. Huge knife uh, is melee. Melee strength use AP minus one to damage. Ouch. Yeah, it's good. An open bodyguard. Huge knife and bodyguard. Yeah, that's good. Huge knife. Yeah, it represents the strength. It's not really a power weapon, it represents the sheer strength of the brute. I mean, he's double the size, three times the size of a human being. And you can imagine the strength of an ogre. Right, so, uh, war gear. This model I place is Ripper Gun with a Grenadier Gauntlet or Bulgrin Malt, which we've been through, or points cost. This model I place its huge knife with a Slab Shield or Brute Shield. So we'll look at them now. Slab shield uh, will cost you zero points. And then you've got a brute shield. Brute shield is unique weaponry. So that's zero points as well. All right, okay. Can't complain there. Right, avalanche of muscle. You can add one to the attacks characteristic of this model in the fight phase on any turn in which it made a successful charge. This ability may not be used the first time. So it may only be used for the first time this model fights each turn. That's fair enough. Uh, brute Shield, 4 plus invulnerable save. Borgrin Plate. A model in Borgrin Plate has a save characteristic of 4 plus. Borgrin Plate. Borgrin Plate is 5 points. Pretty handy. Four plus save. Um, bodyguard. Uh, roll a d6 each time an Astromilitarum character loses a wound whilst they are in three of this model. A roll of three plus. The Astromilitarum uh, character does not lose a wound, but this model suffers a mortal wound in addition 
this model may only be selected as your sorry may not be selected as your warlord and may not be given a warlord trait. That's fair enough. Uh, slab shield. Add two to any saving rolls for this model equipped with a slab shield. That is very very good. For zero points, <laughs> it's very powerful indeed. So technically, you can equip Ogrins with. Does it say replace the Ripper gun? No. You, just, you could have two weapons, can't you? Replace the huge knife, because Ogrins have a huge knife as standard. So you can have, if you wanted to, a riot shield and a Ripper gun. Or brute shield and Ripper gun, looks like. Correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, but I think you can do that. Okay, Ogrins. It's just the same, really, except he has the standard Ogrin has three wounds, a uh, leadership of seven. They've got good leadership now, better than the previous edition. And Ogrin Bonehead, the same, except he's got four attacks. And. Yep, can fool the rules for. The Ogrins. Ogrins are great. I love Ogrins. They're fantastic. Uh, ball Ogrins are the same. Just basically the same rules as the Ogrins. Uh, actually, we'll, we'll check the points actually. How much is an Ogrin? So an Ogrin will cost you 30 points per model. So it's expensive. Uh, then you've got Ballgrins. Ballgrins will cost you 35 points. Power level 7, power level 5, Ogrins, power level 7 for Borgrins. It's a pretty high power level actually. And basically, in each of both of these units, this unit contains one Ogrin Bonehead and two Ogrins. It may contain up to three additional Ogrins, power level rating of 4 plus, or up to six additional Ogrins, power level plus 8. Each model is armed with a ripper gun and frag grenades. Alright, so you can't take a, a huge knife. Fair enough, that's cool. I thought so. That's the only difference, but Ogren bodyguards do. So, um, now we've got Borgrins. So let's read this out here. Uh, the unit contains one Borgrin bonehead and two Ballgrins. It may contain up to three additional Ballgrins, power level rating of 6 plus, plus 6, or up to six additional Ballgrins of power rating of plus 12. They can be very expensive actually in power level, but they're very powerful with three wounds apiece. They're very difficult to stop. Yeah, they're good. They're very good. Ogrins, we love you. Naughty Dog has all the rule stats for. Ogrins, except he has some unique rules. Naughty Dork, how many points does he cost? He's power level 4, unique character. Name characters, this is includes war gear, 80 points. Naughty Dork is weapon skill 3+, plus, plus skill 4+, plus, strength 5, toughness 5, wound 6, attacks 4, leash 8, save 4+. Plus. Uh, so he's armed with ripper gun, huge knife, ripper gun, melee, thunderous headbutt. Let's look at this. Thunderous Headbutt is melee, range melee, type melee, strength plus 3, AP minus 2, D3 damage. Hilarious. Naughty Dork, just imagine Naughty Dork headbutting a tank and blowing it up. <laughs> awesome. Naughty Dork can only make a single, single Thunderous Headbutt attack each time he fights. Well, that kind of makes sense, otherwise he'll just headbutt everyone to death. Frag Bomb. Now this is good. I'm glad that Games Workshop have done this because I didn't understand why the same, they had bigger grenades Ogrins do than regular frag grenades the Imperial Guard use. It was the same strength characteristic in previous editions but now the Frag Bomb is a proper term and it's proper stat line. So it's strength plus one to normal frag grenade with strength four AP0 damage 1, which is really good that they've done that. That is really well done to the rules writers. It's excellent stuff. Avalanche of Muscle, Heroic Sacrifice. 
So, uh, heroic sacrifice. If Norgdy Dork is slain in the fight phase, you can immediately fight with him before removing his model as a casualty, even if he has already been chosen to fight during that phase. So, uh, it's kind of better than spending three stratagem points for a Space Marine if he dies. So he just gets that as standard without even spending the stratagems. That's a really, really powerful ability. He has. Loyal to the end. Roll a d6 each time a friendly Astronaut Time character loses a wound. So on a 2 plus instead of a 3 plus, the Astronaut Time character does not lose the wound, but Naughty Dork suffers a mortal wound. In addition, Naughty Dork may not be selected as your Warlord and may never give him the Warlord trait. That's fair enough. But he's. Nice, nice rules writing here. Really well clarified. I've got him. I want to paint him up. It'd be quite funny and entertaining, I reckon, in battle reports. So, now, uh, Rattlings. I have 30 Rattlings. Uh, I think I have 15 painted. 15 of them painted out of 30 for the regiment. So, in a regiment, I'd have... In a company, I'd have one unit of ten ogrins and one unit of ten of rattlings. It's per company. I'm doing three companies, hence a regiment. So it's 30 rattlings, 30 ogrins. Uh, right. So, a rattling only has a movement rating of five, which is interesting. Because they're slow on their feet. Uh, weapon skill five plus, ballistic skill three plus. Strength two, toughness two, wounds one, attacks one, leadership five, save six plus. Uh, rattlings are great for shooting with sniper rifles, but that's all they're good at, really. And they're good at hiding and shooting away from the enemy. The unit contains five rattlings. It may contain up to five additional rattlings. Power rating of plus one. Each model is armed with a sniper rifle. Power level two. A rattling will cost you five points. That's that is very cheap. So for a 50 point unit, it's quite handy, you can have a unit of 10. So, uh, weapon, sniper rifle, that's what they're called. Usually Imperial Guard uh, sniper rifle would be called a long las, but rattlings are not technically, technically speaking, uh, regiment from the Imperial Guard, they're just auxiliars, or was it auxiliaries. So they're called sniper rifles, range 36, heavy 1, strength 4, AP 0, damage 1. Okay, a model firing a sniper rifle can target a enemy character, even if they are not in the closest enemy unit. If you roll a wound of a 6 plus for this weapon, it inflicts a mortal wound in addition to its normal damage. So, you roll to hit, you roll a 6, it's a mortal wound in addition to another save they have to make on top of that. Very powerful. Abilities. Find the best spot. Instead of deploying, the nor uh, deploying normally, this unit may wait until both armies are fully deployed and then be placed anywhere on the board that is more than 18 away from the enemy models. So basically the old rules for infiltrate. They can do that. Very handy. Uh, shoot sharp and scarper. Immediately after making a shooting attack, other than firing overwatch, which is very good, they got did that. This unit can move as if it were the movement phase, though it cannot advance as part of that move. Fair enough. Uh, naturally stealthy. Uh, models in this unit receive plus two to their same throw when they receive the benefits of cover instead of only one. Which makes up the kind of similar save to Imperial Guard whilst they're in cover. Yeah, they're cool. So keywords, Imperium Astrumitarum, Militarum Auxilia, and Infantry Rattlings. So they think they can take orders as well. Interesting stuff here. Uh, I don't think they can. No, they can't. Um, Ogrins and Rattlings can't take orders because they don't have the regiment keyword. Okay, now we're going to look at Hellhounds. Hellhounds, Devil Dog and Bean Wolf. A Hellhound will cost you... And Hellhound. Hellhounds variation is 73 points. Hellhound is a movement of 12, 
good movement. Weapon skill 6 plus, ballistic skill uh, 4 plus, strength 6, toughness 7, wounds 11, attacks 3, leadership 7, save 3 plus. And it's the same stat lines for the Devil Dog and the Bing Wolf. So, uh, this unit contains one Hellhound, Devil Dog, or Bing Wolf. It can include, in addition to the Hellhound, Devil Dog, Bing Wolf, power rating is 6 plus 6, or additional two Hellhounds, Devil Dog, Bing Wolf, blah, 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 at 12. Power rating. Each Hellhound is equipped with a heavy bolter and Inferno Cannon. An Inferno Cannon is a ranged weapon. This is the where are you? Inferno. I for Inferno. Range weapons? Is it unique? I think it's a unique weapons. Inferno cannon. <laughs> I think it just comes with it as standard. Oh, Inferno, beg your pardon. There he is, he's there. Uh, 20 points. You can just imagine in the comments of people watching. It's like, no, James, it's there, it's there. But I'll actually find it. So it's 20 points for an Inferno Cannon. So look at the Inferno Cannon. So Inferno Cannon is range 16. Good range. It's actually very good range. Uh, they've increased the range, I believe, for that. It's heavy 2d6, strength 6, AP minus 1, 1 damage. This weapon automatically hits its target. Uh, in the previous edition, Hellhound was very different. It was a range of 12. Uh, it's 1d6, strength 6, AP minus 1, 2 damage. But I prefer that stat, the new one. It's much more sensible. It's better. And it makes Hellhounds more and more likely to be chosen in a game as a very powerful unit. Uh, the next one is the Devil Dog, equipped with a Melter Cannon. So the Devil Dog is the anti-tank uh, variant of the Hellhound series. So the Devil Dog is armed with a Melter Cannon. M for Melter Cannon. Melter Cannon. Melter Cannon is 20 points. I think these are all 20 points, but always good to double check. Melter Cannon is range 24, Assault D3, Strength 8, AP minus 4, D6 damage. It's basically the same rules for Melter. So the target is in half range of this weapon. Roll two dice when inflicting damage uh, with it and discard the lowest result. Uh, very, very powerful ability there. Uh, I've yet to make them. I've built them. I've got to paint them. So I've so many things I've got to paint. These are just one of them. Many things I've got to do. And then you've got the Chem Cannon, which is known as the Bean Wolf. Chem Cannon. Chem Cannon is actually, no, it's only 15 points. Chem Cannon is range 8, so it's not very good range. Um, strength, it's heavy D6. Strength is always wounds of a 2 plus. We'll look at that in a minute. Let's double check. AP minus 3, 1 damage. This weapon automatically hits its target. In addition, it wounds on a 2 plus unless the target is in a vehicle, in which case it always wounds on a 6. Fair enough. Nice clarification, nice simple wording there. And then you can form up into vehicle squadrons. Now, vehicle squadrons in this edition are very, very good. So, I was thinking for a 2000 point list. I could fill an entire tank company, which is really what I want to do. So, just to clarify what tank uh, vehicle squadron can do. Okay, vehicle squadron. Uh, right. The first time this unit is set up, all models in this unit must be placed within six of each other from that point onwards. Each operates independently and is treated as a separate unit for all purposes. So, must be placed within six of each other but it acts independently. Okay, So, for example, that applies when it's been charged or something like that. So, it's very, very handy. So, squadron coherency. It used to be 4 inch coherency, now they've done so 6 inches. Very good. Scout Sentinels. Okay, Scout Sentinel. 
Uh, movement of 9, weapon skill 4 plus, ballistic skill 4 plus, strength 5, toughness 5, wound 6, attacks 1, leadership 7, save 4 plus. A scout sentinel will cost you 35 points. 35 points, power level 3. Uh, this unit contains one scout sentinel, it can include one additional scout sentinel, power rating of plus 3, or additional two scout sentinels, a power rating of plus 5. So there's one less power level, which is good. Each more is equipped with a multi-laser. So, a multi-laser. This remember, does not include war gear, so you have to pay the points, unlike in the previous edition. M for multi-laser. Multi-laser is 20 points. 20 points. So, uh, right, so we know the rules for them. It's a unique weapon actually, the multi-laser, so we go through that. So the multi-laser is range 36, heavy 3, strength 6, AP 0, damage 1. So, yes, that's pretty cool actually. So the auto cannon will go through. So an auto cannon costs you 15 points. Heavy flamer, that'll cost you 17 points. Hunter killer missile, I believe, is 6 points. H for hunter killer missile, yep, 6 points. Adding that on top as well as the uh, main weapon. Or primary weapon. Laz cannon is 20 points. Missile launcher, I believe, is 20 points. Missile launcher, yep, 20 points. You can have frag and crack as well. And sentinel chainsaw. Uh, sentinel chainsaw is unique weapon. Of a war gear, sentinel chainsaw is 2 points. Uh, it is um, range melee, type melee, strength user, AP minus one, one damage. Okay, war gear. We're in through that, what they can have. So any model may replace is multi laser with a heavy flame, auto cannon, lots of launcher, and las cannon. Uh, any model may take a sensor chainsaw, and any uh, model may take a hunter killer missile. Right. Uh, I made a mistake actually in one of the videos I've done. I've done a showcase video of scout sentinels. And I added the plasma cannons in the Scout Sentinel, but you can't take plasma cannons, so I do apologise for that. But armoured sentinels, you can, for definite. Uh, so I didn't mean to do that, I was ignorant of the rules, silly me, my fault. Because <laughs> I hardly used them when I first painted them, but now I do know that you can't take them. But fortunately, I plan to do a company of sentinels, I plan to do a company of armoured sentinels as well, for the regiment. So, abilities. This is the important thing. If a model of this unit is reduced to zero runes, I roll d6, removing the model from the battlefield, I roll a six explodes, and each unit in three suffers one mortal wound. Uh, scout vehicle. At the start of the first battle round, before the first turn begins, you can move this unit up to nine. It cannot end its move more than nine away from the enemy models. This is very, very handy tactic. I found this out with one of Luke's battle reports. I'm not going to tell you what happened, but the ability to move forward before the game commences is very powerful, and I try to do that with Scout Sentinels. It's really, really powerful, and you'll find out soon enough. Check out Luke's channel for that battle report. It's Tau against Imperial Guard debut for the Astro Militarum Codex, 8th edition. Uh, has the rules for smoke launchers as well. Very powerful. Uh, armor Sentinels, basically the same except he's got a 3 plus save and plus 1 toughness and it can be equipped with a plasma cannon and the power level rating is 3 and I'm going to check the rules to see how many points a plasma cannon costs. Plasma cannon, here we come. Plasma cannon Plasma cannon is 15 points, so it's pretty cheap actually. Uh, it doesn't have the scout ability, but other than that, they are very good. Very, very good. I like armor. I love sentinels, I think they're a fantastic unit to have in the game. Heavy weapons squad. 
Heavy Weapons Squad. H for Heavy Weapons. So, Heavy Weapons Squad, you can have three of them. You must have models per unit. And six points per model. Uh, heavy Weapons Squad is movement six, weapon skill four plus, skill four plus, strength three, top of three, wins two, attacks two, leadership six, save five plus. So you can take the heavy weapons list, three of them. Uh, bear in mind, this is the thing you can do now. You can fire your heavy weapon as well as your las gun. Remember that. In the new rules, you can do that. Because it's only pistols and grenades. With anything of the assault or pistols, you can't uh, shoot with that one. But with las guns and heavy weapons, you can. It's a single model. Okay, uh, Basilisks. I've been mean to get Basilisks. I will eventually get Basilisks. People have been commenting, saying, when are you going to get Basilisks, when are you get Basilisks? I will get Basilisks. I will try and get a regiment done when I can, but I only ever use painted and base models. And that is the principle that I always will stick to. So I will get Basilisks. plan to do a battery. Two ba uh, three batteries, a company of Basilisks, which is nice. Uh, Basilisks have changed. Uh, power rate level rating of 7. It's actually quite good actually. Uh, cheap for power level. And the points for a Basilisk will cost you 100 points. 100 points. And then on top of that, that doesn't include uh, war gear. So you have to pay for the Earth Shaker Cannon. Earth Shaker Cannon will cost you zero points for 100 points. That's very, very good. Wow, that is zero points for an Earth Shaker Cannon. That includes it. Okay, so Earth Shaker Cannon is range 100, uh, 240 inches, which is artillery piece, which is what it represents. Heavy D6. It's strength 9, AP minus 3, D3 damage. Uh, roll two dice for the number of attacks when firing this weapon and discard the lowest result. This weapon can target units that are not visible to the bear. So it is very powerful actually. Uh, they have changed slightly, the rules. I believe it was heavy D3. And then it was strength 9, AP minus 2, uh, D6 damage. I think, but it's now D3 and the AP is better, so they changed that slightly. You can compare that to the index if you want to find that out for yourself, in case you get it wrong. And then, yes, you can have a vehicle squadron, that's the squadron rules. You can have up to three additional basilisks, or two additional basilisks, open your pardon. All the rules for vehicle squadrons explodes, it has 11 wounds, yeah, they're cool. Another thing to mention about heavy weapon squads, they usually get picked on, but you'll find out that they are better in this edition with stratagems, which we'll look at later. The Wyverns, Wyverns, however you want to pronounce it, uh, linguistically, I hope I got it right <laughs> when pronouncing. So, a Wyvern has a move characteristic of 12, weapon skill 6+, plus, plus skill it's the same as the Hellhound, basically. And then how much, how many points is a Woven Quad Storm Shred Mortar? Zero points. Okay. That's very handy. So you don't have to pay any points. That includes the gear. And the Waverins will cost you 85 points. The vehicle itself. Power rating is 6. And uh, right, the Wyvern and Quad Shred, uh, Storm Shard Mortar is heavy 4d6. That's pretty powerful. Uh, strength 4, AP 0, damage 1. It's not very good, but this weapon can target units that are not visible to the bearer. You can reroll failed wound rolls for this weapon, so it's very good at shredding. It's a light artillery piece, very good at shredding stuff. Hydras. Um, right. The Hydra will cost you... Hmm, da, 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 Hydra... Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? H for Hydra. 100 points. And the Quad Auto Cannon... 
Hydra Quad Auto Cannon. H. 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 Hydra Quad Auto Cannon will cost you zero points. So that does include the War Gear. Um, so. Hydra Quad Auto Cannon. Vehicle Squadron, you can have them in as well. Uh, Hydra Quad Auto Cannon is range 72. A heavy 8, strength 7, AP minus 1, 2 damage. Add 1 to hit rolls made for this weapon against targets that can fly. Subtract 1 to hit rolls made for this weapon against all other targets. That's absolutely fair enough because it's primarily used for anti aircraft capability, which is very, very good. Hydras are good. I love Hydras. Even though I'm not over keen on the rules for flyers in general, uh, it is good. It's, it's nice. Manticore. The Manticore. Uh, power level rating of 8. Uh, right. Manticore. How much is a Manticore? Manticore. M for Manticore. It will cost you 125 points. And Storm Eagle Rockets will cost you 0 points. So it does include it in the, the price. Storm Eagle Rocket is range 120. Heavy 2d6, strength 10 AP minus 2, d3 damage. It's very, very good. Much better than in previous editions. Uh, this target, this uh, weapon can target units that are not visible to the bearer. A model can only fire one Storm Eagle Rocket per turn. Each Storm Eagle Rocket can only f be fired once per battle. So it's basically one of those per battle. One, one of those per turn, and then you keep firing till the end. Of, they're all gone. <laughs> um, only once has that tank survived when it's fired all its rockets. <laughs> so, yeah, they're cool. Manticores. Plan to get a battery of them for the regiment. So, in a regiment, there'll be one of them per company. So, the battery of three would make a regiment. And a death strike, however, is very different. You. In the law, you'd only have one death strike per regiment. So I'm only going to have one of these, which is nice. So a death strike, D for death strike, is 155 points. And a death strike missile is zero points, because it comes included, which makes sense. A death strike missile is range 200, heavy 3D6, Strength dash AP dash damage dash. Okay, this weapon can only be fired once per battle. This weapon can target units that are not visible to the bearer. Each time you hit the target with this weapon, it suffers a mortal wound. After resolving all damage to this unit, roll a d6 for every other unit within six of the target unit. On a four plus, that unit also suffers d3 mortal wounds. That is absolutely brutal when firing. But there are some unique special rules for this. So it has explodes, it's the same as the Manticore and Hellhounds, etc. Smoke launch is the same. The hour is nigh! The Death Strike missile cannot be fired normally in the shooting phase or during Overwatch. In one of your shooting phases, so it's only the shooting phase, if you wish to fire the Death Strike missile, Roll a d6 and add the battle round number if the result is 8 or more. If you you've, you can fire the Death Strike missile during the shooting phase, for example, in the third battle round on a roll of 5+, plus, it would need it to be fired the Death Strike missile launcher. But fair enough. So it's a one-shot wonder if the, if the regiment was under pear-shaped situation, they would fire this according to the law. So they know the dredgeon's going to be over wiped out. Fire their strike and get out. <laughs> there are stratagems for this later on as we go through the codex. So we've been through the rules for the Lehman Russ. Uh, exactly the same except it's ballistic skill of 4 plus instead of 3 plus and they can't issue orders. Everything else is the same. Lehman Russ is a superb. They're fantastic. And you can take vehicle squadrons as well for up to 3. Okay, the Chimera. A little bit different. It's the same as the Hellhounds, except it's got 10 wounds as opposed to 11. And it has a transport capacity as well. 
So, the multi laser. How many points is a multi laser? M for multi laser. We looked at this earlier on, didn't we? M for multi laser. Multi laser is 10 points. And a chimera. A chimera, actually, we'll look to the points of the death strike. The Lehman Russ. We'll tell you how many points a Lehman Russ is before it moves forward too quickly. A Lehman Russ will cost you. Uh, Lehman Russ. Lehman Russ battle tanks will cost you 122 points. Yep, 122 points. Power level rating 10. I'll tell you what, that power level rating has gone considerably down. As compared to the other edition, and as compared to the index, Lehman Russes were power level 11, they've gone down to power level 10. Very cool. Nice one. Okay, the Chimera. Uh, the Chimera will cost you 75 points. That's more expensive. Plus the multi laser of 10 points. It mounts up, and the heavy flamer is 17 points. Heavy bolter is eight points, so maybe the option of having a heavy bolter on the Chimera is the preferable option. But multi laser is good with a high caliber strength, <coughs> but with the AP minus the heavy bolter is better. So uh, the Las Gun Array, I believe that is zero points. Las Gun Array, yep, zero points because it comes with the Chimera. Basically, it's three las guns. Uh, so it's rapid fire three, strength three, AP zero, damage one. This weapon can only be fired if the unit is embarked upon a vehicle equipped with it. So you have to have men manning it, which is very realistic. Okay, transport. This model can transport 12 Astro Militarum infantry models. Each heavy weapons team or veteran heavy weapons team. Uh, each weapons team or veteran heavy weapons team takes up the space of two, and each ogren takes up the space of three. Hence, that's why they're three times the size. Next is the Torox. The Torox is. Ooh, 40 points. Oh, that's cheap. Plus, you've got to add weaponry and things like that. Um. It has a transport capacity of 10 as opposed to 12, which is only different. So it's movement 14, which is very good. However, it's minus one toughness, but it's safe 3 plus still, which is good. The Torox. Torox Prime. Uh, anything unique here? Torox Missile Launcher. Torox Prime costs you 65 points, but it's plus one ballistic skill, which makes it a 3 plus. 3 plus ballistic skill, which is good. And. Torox Gatling Gun. Weapon. Torox Gatling Gun. Gatling Cannon is 18 points. Uh, power level rating is 6. The vehicle. So, it is. Uh, range 24, heavy 20, strength 4, AP 0, damage 1. Heavy 20. It's a lot of shots, which is good. Okay, transport capacity. Ten, yep. Yeah. yeah, it can only transport Minotaur, uh, Minotaur and Tempestus and Officer Perfectus infantry models. That's fair enough. That's no problem at all. Valkyries. Valkyrie has a power level rating of 8 and it will cost you uh, 110 points. But if you add LAS cannons to it, uh, tw how much is a twin las cannon? Twin. Is there such a thing as twin las cannon? Let's find out. Okay, this unit contains one Valkyrie. It can include one additional Valkyrie at power rating of plus eight, and two additional Valkyries at power rating of plus fifteen. Each model is equipped with a multi laser and hell strike missiles. So now the rules for multi laser and the points. Uh, Hell strike missiles. Hell strike missile. Hell strike missiles. Where are you? You are here somewhere. 
Hell Strike. Where are you? You're coming. I'm gonna find you. Hell Strike Missile, here we go. It is 20 points. It's expensive, but they've made them better. Uh, Hell Strike Missiles. Uh, okay, so the, the Valkyrie is movement of 45, weapon skill 6 plus, ballistic skill 4 plus, strength 7, toughness 7, moons 14, attacks 3, leadership 7, save 3 plus. So, um, yeah, it looks like there's no such thing as twin les cannon anymore with the vendetta. Yeah, fair enough. Two las cannons? No, nope, I got rid of that. So you can fire your las cannons, I think, independently. Unless it. Oh no, it's. Um, I think the rules are from Forge World, so you have to get the uh, index from the Forge World. That's why there's no. Uh, I figured it out now. There's no. They've done official rule stats for Valkyrie Vendettas in the Forge World index book. So you have to check that out. So it's just a standard Valkyrie. Um, right, unique rules. So, Rocket Pod. Uh, there's Rocket Pod and Hell Strike Missiles. So, Hell Strike Missiles, range 72, heavy 1, strength 8, AP minus 2, D6 damage. Uh, roll 2 dice when inflicting the damage for this weapon and discard the dice result. That's very handy. And, there's no limited ammunition anymore. So, there's no more. You can only fight 2, you can fire all of them. That's cool. Uh, right, the multiple rocket pod is range 36, heavy D6, actually assault D6. Ooh, so there's no minus ballistic skill there. And you can advance and still fire the rocket pods. Ah, rocket pods are cool. Uh, strength 5, AP minus 1, 1 damage. So it's D6. Uh, right. So, Rocket Pod, R for Rocket Pod. Let's double check what it's called. Multiple Rocket Pod, so it's M. Alphabetical order. Multiple Rocket Pod will cost you 11 points. That's good. Rocket Pods are great. Nice one. I like that. So. Uh, special rules, vehicle squadron, grav cute insertion, models may disembark from this vehicle at any point during its move, but if the vehicle, if the Valkyrie moves more than 20 inches, you must roll a d6 for each model disembarking, in order of one, the model is slain, and models that disembark in, the ma in this manner must be set up more than 9 from any enemy models, which is very handy. Uh, hover jet. Is a new rule for here for the Valkyrie. Hover jet. Before this model moves in your movement phase, you can declare it will hover. It mo moves characteristic becomes 20 to the end of the phase. It loses the airborne, hard to hit, and supersonic abilities until the beginning of your next movement phase. That's fair enough. Uh, roving, roving gunship. Uh, if this model hovers in the moon phase, add one to hit rolls made for it for the following shooting phase. So if you don't move, that's incredibly powerful. So hitting on freeze, yeah, it's good. Airborne, this model cannot charge, it can only be charged by units that can fly and can only attack or be attacked in the fight phase by units that can fly. Fair enough. That's very handy actually to protect your Valkyrie. Hard to hit, so minus one to hit when shooting at it when in flight mode. So your opponent must subtract one to hit rolls for attacks that target this model in the shooting phase. So I think it's just a minus flat minus one to hit. Supersonic. Each time this model moves First pivot it on the spot and turn it up to 90 degrees. This does not contribute um, to how far the model moves, which is good clarification. And then move the model straight forwards. Note that it cannot pivot again after the initial pivot. 
when the model advances, increase its movement characteristic by 20 until the end of the phase. Do not roll a dice. So it has a f so. Yeah, just flat 20. Crash and burn. Uh, if you roll anyone in six, they suffer d3 mortal wounds on roll of six if it explodes. Ooh, Valkyries are great. Now the big boys. I call them the big boys. They are the Bane Blade series. Bane Blade super heavy tanks have improved considerably. So, a Bane Blade will cost you 390 points. 390 points. A Bane Blade is a single model equipped with Auto Cannon, Bane Blade Cannon, Demolisher Cannon, and a Twin Heavy Bolter and adamantium tracks. So, let's look at this up. A Bane Blade Cannon will cost you zero points. Zero points. Um, auto Cannon, so we'll look at the Demolisher Cannon. D for Demolisher. I don't believe it, it's zero points. Oh no, no, it's 40 points. Nope, you add that on top, it looks like. Yep, it's 40 points. And then, and can, so I'm with twin heavy bolter, which is uh, 16 points. Okay, twin, oh, big pump, twin heavy bolter is 14 points. Which is nice, so a little bit of cheaper. And adamantium tracks, it's melee, it's zero points. So, okay, that's the points. Power level of 28, 390 points. So, the Bane Blade Cannon. Now, it used to be uh, heavy 2d6. Now, look at the profile now. It's heavy 3d6. Range 72, heavy 3d6, strength 9, AP minus 3, 3 damage. Ouch. Very nasty tank. Now the Bane Blade series that I have, I have quite a few, I have one uh, Shadow Sword variant and one Bane Blade variant. I plan to use all of these variants because all of them now are really good and there's a couple that I have never used in any edition. I plan to use them in future battle reports. I, try, I plan to rotate the tanks around, see how good they are. Give them a try. Uh, right, okay, right, here we go, explodes, if this model is reduced to zero runes, roll a d6 before removing it from the battlefield, on a roll of a 6 it explodes, and each unit within 2d6 suffers d6 mortal wounds, that's the big disadvantage of the Bane Blade, <laughs> even though it's better, on, it's only on a 6 instead of a 5 plus in a previous edition, uh, it's on a roll of 6, when it explodes it goes nuts. But it's kind of realistic in a way because it's got a ton of ammunition storage in there. Yeah, smoke launchers as well. Steel Bayamoff. Now the Steel Bayamoff rule his makes Bane Blades so much better. Steel Bayamoff. This model does not suffer the penalty to hit rolls for moving and firing heavy weapons. That's all of them. Oh, uh, this model can fall back in the movement phase and still shoot or charge during the turn. It can also still fire its, heavy, its weapons if the enemy units are in one of it, but only its twin heavy bolt or twin heavy flamer can target units that are within one of it. Its other guns must target other units in addition to the model's only gains a bonus to the saving cover, if at least half of the model is obscured. From the okay, fair enough. Okay, so we actually haven't been through the stats. But that is considerably made Bane Blades a lot better. Firing on the move, move 10, oh yeah. And the close combat capability we're going to find out. So the Adamantium Tracks, uh, we'll read that out quickly. So zero points, uh, range melee, type melee, strength user, which is strength nine, AP minus two, D3 damage, and look how many attacks it has, nine attacks. So Bane Blade, 
is weapon uh, is movement 10, weapon skill 5 plus, which is good for a tank, ballistic skill uh, 4 plus, uh, strength 9, toughness 8, wounds 26, attacks 9, leadership 8, save 3 plus. One extra thing I'd like to add is personally, I wish there was an option to make Bane Blades Ballistic Skill 3 Plus. Now, why do I say this? Uh, one thing there would be a disadvantage if this was the case. It would make Bane Blades too OP. I, I perfectly understand that. But when studying the ranking system of the Imperial Guard, technically speaking, according to the law, all Bane Blades are veteran tank commanders. So in a Lehman Russ tank company, you would have, in the, leading the first company would be a captain, second company would be led by a first lieutenant, and a third company would be led by a second lieutenant. It's the same structure of a Bane Blade. So Bane Blades can't issue orders or anything like that, which is a bit of a shame, but yet again it will make them super powerful. Even if it was 100 points, I would still take that option. Ballistic skill 3 plus for a Bane Blade? Oh yeah. If you wanted to play it lore based and narrative, go for it. But for match play, I, I perfectly understand. So it is a debatable issue, in my opinion. Leave your comments below. What do you think about that change? I think it would be very good if it was optional. Even if it was match play, narrative play, that kind of thing. I think it would be really, really good if they did that. So, Bane Blades are superb. I love them. Brilliant. I bought my first Bane Blade when I was 20 years old. <laughs> I don't really remember the day because I got underneath the Bane Blade, I got my. Uh, birthday year, so I was age 20 when I bought it, and then the, then the Shadow Sword, I got it when I was 21 the next year. Ah <laughs> oh dear me, bit of humour there. Right, this is the Bane Hammer. Now the Bane Hammer is equipped with a thermal cannon. I've used this years ago. It wasn't very good then, but it's a lot better now. So it has all the rules similar to the Bane Blade, except for this one. Uh, thermal cannon is range 60, heavy 3d6, strength 8, AP minus 2, 3 damage. It's pretty nasty. If this uh, unit is hit by this weapon in their following movement phase, they must half their move characteristic and cannot advance. So it's really an anti horde weapon, which is incredibly powerful, but it's only going to slow down one unit because you're targeting on one unit. So it does have its weaknesses because there's no more blast weapons, which can be a bit weak. But strategically speaking, if you want to slow down a unit of Carnifexes that are very powerful, then by all means, yeah, go for it. So, that's cool. Bane Hammer. Next is the Bane Sword. This is the Bane Sword. I've never used this in combat. I will hopefully in the next battle report on Striking Scorpion 82. The Bane Hammer, it's very good now and it's a lot better. The old rules, it was strength uh, 9, AP minus, uh, AP 3, and that was it. But now it's a lot better. It is really, really potent weapon. It's armed with the Quake Cannon. It's range 140, heavy 2d6, uh, strength 14, AP minus 4, D6 damage. When rolling for this weapon damage, treat any rolls of a 1 or a 2 as a 3 instead. So you're always going to get 3 damage. And I need to check the points actually, how many points it costs to have a Bane Hammer. Bane Hammer is 390, it's the same as a Bane Blade and a Bane Sword. Bane Sword is 390 as well. There you go, I didn't even have to check. But double check anyway. Uh, right. So that's all the same. Titanic unit, that kind of thing. Doom Amar is power level of one, uh, 27. I haven't used this one as well. 
there's two I'm meaning to use. The Doom Hammer is four, uh, 420 points. Pretty expensive, but look what it does. Uh, the Magma Cannon is range 60, heavy 2d6, strength 10, AP minus 5, d6 damage. If the targets are in half the range of this weapon, roll two dice when inflicting damage. Um, rid and discard the lowest result. It's the it's a lower caliber weapon than the Shadow Sword, but it's still very powerful. It's pretty good 2d6 shots. Yeah, strength 10, AP minus 5, very good AP minus. Yeah, it's just the lighter version of the Shadow Sword. However, it does have a good advantage. And that is a transport capability. This model can transport 25 Astra Militarum infantry models, each heavy weapons team, Ogryn, etc. We've already been through that. So 25 transport capacity. So you can protect your heavy weapon, uh, your super heavy if it's in trouble. It's very, very powerful. The Hellhammer, probably the most powerful tank, and deservedly so. 30 power level. The Hellhammer will cost you, uh, where are you now, the Hellhammer, Hellhammer is, no actually it's 410 points, even though it's cheaper than the Doomhammer, interesting stuff, 410 points, the Hellhammer is range 36, heavy 3d6, that's better, than it used to be. It used to be 2d6, now it's 3d6. Strength 10, AP minus 4, 3 damage. AP minus 4 is very powerful. Uh, range is not very good, but its range is not bad actually. 36 is good. But strength 10, AP minus 4, uh, 3 damage. Units attacked by this weapon do not gain the bonus to their saving throws for being in cover. That is super powerful. It's a, it's a bunker buster tank. It's a siege tank of a super heavy. Close, close quarters. Shadow Sword. Shadow Sword, you're looking at, is 390 points. This does include all the weapons, by the way, the three. So the Shadow Sword is armed with the Volcano Cannon. It's heavy 3d3. So it used to be d6 shots, but now it's heavy 3d3, which makes it much more reliable. Strength 16, AP minus 5, 2d6 damage. You're going to rip apart tanks with one shot. Uh, you can re-roll failed wound rolls when targeting titanic units with this weapon. So it's really an anti-titan weapon, as well as anti-tank. But primarily it's anti-titan, would you believe? So it's absolutely powerful weapon. The Volcano Cannon is the Shadow Sword. A very popular choice that people use. And then you've got the Storm Lord. The Storm Lord. Uh, the Storm Lord will check how many points that costs. The Storm Lord will cost you 430 points. So it's probably the most expensive Super Heavy variant. All the rules are the same as previous Super Heavies. Except it's armed with the Vulcan Mega Bolter, which is range 60, heavy 20, strength 6, AP minus 2, 2 damage. The weapon itself is good, but there has no special rules anymore for power to all weapons. They've got rid of that, so it could have been. If they had kept that rule, we would have been 40 shots for a Vulcan Mega Bolter. Ah, uh, yeah. So they got rid of that rule, sadly. But, who cares? I'm not worried about it, I'm not fussed about it. Maybe they've sensibilized it more. So, but uh, the reason why it's more expensive is because it has a transport capacity. Instead of 25, it has up to 40 models. And in addition, it has two heavy stubbers on the sponsored sides here. So there you go, that's the Storm Lord. I use that quite often. Probably the most often of that variant. Then you've got the Storm Sword. This is a whole mounted siege variant of the Shadow Sword. So, the Storm Sword will cost you 390 points. The Storm Sword is armed with the same as the Bane Blade like variants. 
Storm Sword Siege Cannon. It's range 36, heavy 2d6, it's good. Strength 10, AP minus 4d6. Damage. Units attacked by this weapon do not gain the bonus to their saving throws for being in cover. Roll, re-roll the damage rolls of 1 for this weapon. So, yeah, that's actually pretty good ability. So you're always going to... Actually, no, if you're all a 1 4 by one you still could get 1 damage. But, uh, the re-roll of a 1... He's good. Yeah, he's very good. So there you go, that's all the stats for the units. So, we've been through all this. Saves a lot of time. Nice illustration there. Nice diorama. Bulwark of Humanity. Here we go. This is the rules for... Additional rules for the Imperial Guard. So, Defenders of Humanity. Ashram Yotaran is a shield of mankind. Only by its sacrifice and heroism are the worlds of the Imperium kept safe. So, if your army is battleforged, all troops units in the Astro Militar detachments and all Lehman Russ units in the Spearhead detachments gain this ability, such as a unit that is within range of an objective marker as specified in the mission. Controls the objective marker even if there are more enemy models within range of it. If an enemy unit within range of the same objective marker has a similar ability, then the objective marker is controlled by the player who has the most models in range of it as normal. So it's cool. So, so Leon Russes are great for the spearhead detachment. Uh, regimental doctrines. If your army is battle force, all regiment units in an Astro Militar detachment, excluding those in the super heavy auxiliary detachments, gain a regimental doctrine so long as Every unit in the detachment, apart from exceptions noted opposite, is drawn from the same regiment. The regimental doctrine gain depends upon the regiment they are drawn from, as shown opposite. For example, a Cadian unit with the regimental doctrine's ability gains the Born Soldier's doctrine. So it's basically talking about these special doctrines that all Cadians will have as standard. Okay. Uh, if your chosen regiment does not have an associated regimental doctrine, you may pick the doctrine that you feel best represents your army. For example, as your army of Valhalla nobles does not have the associated regimental doctrine, uh, sorry, Ven I said Valhalla, didn't I? Silly me. Ventrilean nobles does not have the associated regimental doctrine, you can decide that the Volstorian Erolum weapons doctrine best suits the world the of the well equipped fighters. So basically you try and fit it to the law of whichever regiment you prefer to use, which is perfectly fair enough. Uh, Militarum Tempestus. So there used to be a codex for a separate codex for Militarum Tempestus. Now it's all amalgamated into one codex. Which is good in a way. It saves a lot of money, <laughs> of course. Uh, Militarum Tempestus. Militarum Tempestus units can be included in your Astro Militarum detachment without preventing other units in that detachment from gaining a regimental doctrine. Note, however, that the Militarum Tempestus units do not gain, themselves gain benefit from any regiment doctrine unless every unit in that detachment is from the Militarum Tempestus, in which case they will gain the Stormtrooper doctrine. So, fair enough. So you can have a Cadian regiment organization and then you can have for a separate attachment Militarum Tempestus with their own regimental doctrine which is what happens quite often in games advisors and auxilia so units listed below can be included in the Astro Militarum detachment without preventing other units in that doc detachment from gaining regimental doctrine note however that units listed below can never themselves benefit from a regimental doctrine so, for example, uh, Tech Priest, Engine Seer, Servitors, uh, Ministor and Priest, Crusaders, uh, oh, uh, oh, my linguistic is terrible, uh, Aeronautica Imperialis units, Ministor and Auxilia, so Ogrins and Ratlings don't benefit from Regiment, like I said earlier, Officer Prefectus, that includes Commissars, and Scholitica Pythonica, so that's Psychers. Forgive me if I said that wrong. <laughs> so, uh, right, uh, match play rule command squads. Okay, 
If you are playing a matched play game, then in a battle-forged army, you can include a maximum of one regiment command squad, page 96, in a detachment for each regiment officer that is the detachment. So, what this basically saying is, that's very good that they've added that. So, yeah, for every officer you have, so you can't have loads of officers like command squads. Uh, so hold on. Uh, if you're playing a match play game. Okay, let's read this carefully. This is actually quite important. If you are playing a match play game, then in the Battle Force Army, you can include a maximum of a regiment command squad. See page 96. In a detachment for each regiment officer in the detachment. Similarly, if you are playing a match play game, if you are playing a match play game, then in a Battle Force Army, you can include a maximum of one in the Stalin Tempest Command Squad. See page 98. In the attachment for the Tempest of Brian, blah, blah, blah. Right. That's rather interesting. I have to bear that in mind. Uh, easy to forget that. Right. Moving on. Regimental Doctrines. This is one of the big changes of Games Workshop that Astro Militar have made. That's so much better. So here we go. Cadian Doctrine. Born Soldiers. Reroll hit rolls of one in the shooting phase for units with this doctrine if they did not move in the previous movement phase. If an infantry unit with this doctrine is issued the take aim order and did not move in its previous movement phase, reroll all failed hit rolls for the unit until the end of the phase instead. Wow, that is super powerful. Super, super powerful. Uh, yeah, I, I love that doctrine for my Cadians, and so they should be after their planet has fallen. And they just the, the law behind them is that they're well trained and disciplined, and they're, nat they're natural marksmen. Uh, Cat Chans, so uh, brutal, uh, brutal strength. Uh, infantry units with this doctrine add one to their strength characteristic. In addition, they add one to their leadership characteristic if they are in six of a friendly Kachan officer. Each time a vehicle with this doctrine fires a ranged weapon that makes a random number of attacks, example a heavy D6 or heavy 2D6, etc., you can reroll one of the dice used to determine the number of attacks made. So if it's 2D6 and you roll a 6 followed by a 1, you, you don't even have to spend anything or command points or anything, you just get that as standard. So you just re-roll the one, which is nice. If, but if you roll a double one, you have to roll one of the dice. That's how I read it from here, judging by my intellect. Uh, next is uh, Valhallen Doctrine, is the Grim Deminer. Grim Deminer. Infantry units of this doctrine half the number of models that flee, rounding up. That's cool. If they fail a morale test, vehicles with this doctrine that have damage table double the number of wounds they have remaining for the purposes of determining what their characteristics are. That's pretty handy. So tanks are pretty hard for Valhallens. And uh, Volstorian. Uh, Herulum weapons. Heralum weapons, however you pronounce it. Uh, units of this doctrine add six inches to the maximum range of heavy or rapid fire weapons if they fire, which would normally have a range of 24 or more. So a las gun has a range 30 for Volstorians. All Volstorians have range 30 las guns. That is super powerful. Okay, Armageddon Steel Legion. Industrial efficiency. Infantry units in this doctrine, with this doctrine, may double the number of attacks they make with rapid fire weapons at range of up to 18 rather than half the weapon's range as normal. Uh, vehicles with this doctrine treat attacks against them with AP minus 1 as AP minus 0. Yeah, that is uh, pretty good actually, extra, extra protection for vehicles. Okay, uh, Talan. Swift as the wind. Infantry units with this doctrine can advance and still shoot. 
any weapon type except heavy weapons. When they do so, they do not suffer the usual penalties to hit rolls for assault weapons, vehicles with the doctrine that do not suffer the penalty to their hit rolls. Moving with firing heavy weapons is the Titanic vehicle. Ah, so they can advance and fire the Titanic. That's very powerful indeed. But the doctrine advances and treats all heavy weapons as equipped with assault weapons until the end of the turn. Example, heavy D6 weapon is treated as an assault D6 weapon. Militarum Tempestus, Stormtroopers. If a model of this doctrine is shooting at a target half the range or less, it can make an extra shot with the same weapon at the same target. For each hit roll of a 6 plus, you make that you make of that model. These extra shots do not themselves generate any extra further attacks by any additional shots. Okay, Mordian Iron Guard. Now, this looks rather interesting. Um, if the base... So they're called Parade Drill. Parade Drill! If the base of every model is an infantry unit with this doctrine is touching the base of at least one other model from the same unit, the unit has plus one leadership and you can add one to the hit rolls made for models that have been fired overwatch. Flip me, that's very powerful. You can add one to the hit roll made with vehicles from this doctrine when firing Overwatch if they are within three of one or more other friendly Mordian vehicles. <laughs> Super powerful that is. Yeah, we're in three inches. Because vehicle coherency in a squadron is six inches. But if you're tighter together, you get that bonus. Super powerful. Stratagems. Stratagems are game changers. It's important to know your stratagems. So, here we go. Vortex Missile for three command points. Use this stratagem before you fire the Death Strike Missile. You can reroll failed hit rolls for this shot. In addition, add one to the roll made to determine whether other units within six are hit. If the model is wounded but not slain by the attack, roll another dice. On a six, the model suffers a further d6 mortal wounds. So, you thought vortex missiles were powerful. This stratagem makes it very powerful. It's free command points, but it makes it oh, you will delete units literally. <laughs> it's super powerful. Uh, right, fire my position. Okay, use this stratagem when the last model is slain from an astrobilitarum unit from your army equipped with a Vox Caster. Before removing the model, roll a d6 for each unit within three of it. On a roll of four plus, that unit suffers d3 mortal wounds. That is very, very powerful. Uh, you can most likely do that if you have a brigade detachment, if you have like a horde of orcs or something like that, or characters even. Anyone within uh, it says within three inches, then yeah, that's super powerful. That is okay. Here's a good one crush them. Remember, Bane Blades with the adamantium tracks. Use this stratagem at the start of the charge phase. Select an Astra Militarum vehicle from your army. This unit can charge even if it advanced this turn in the following fight phase. Attacks made by it hit on a 2 plus. So adamantium tracks hitting on a 2 plus. Oh that's good. Okay. Aerial spotter. Uh, two command points. Uh, use this stratagem at the start of the shooting phase. Select a basilisk or wavering model from your army. You can real roll failed to hit rolls for this unit for this phase. Nice one. Um, jury rigging. Uh, one command point. Use this stratagem at the start of your turn. Select an Astra Militarum vehicle from your army. It cannot move, charge, or pile in this turn, but it immediately heals one wound. You may think, is that really a point to do that? Well, yes, there is, because you could be uh, suffering from a damage bracket, but then you can repair it for one command point if you don't do anything. And so it cannot move cannot move, charge, or pile in. So let's say you can't shoot. So you can still shoot and repair. Nice. 
so you can so if you're like halfway bracket you just gone over the halfway bracket I just want to say oh now spend a command point to bring that back it's great rigging very good okay uh, consolidate squads uh, right so one CP use this strategy at the end of your movement phase choose an infantry squad page 93 from your army that is within two of another of your infantry squads from the same regiment you can merge these squads into a single unit and they are treated as such for the rest of the battle now remember we had that problem with heavy weapon squads they kept getting picked on but now in any of the time of the phase when spending the stratagem so the end of the movement phase begging your pardon end of the movement phase and you can merge a heavy weapon squad to an infantry squad so it protects your heavy weapon squads good tactics here very powerful stratagems uh, okay, one to three CP uh, Imperial Commander's Armory. Uh, use this stratagem before the battle. Uh, your army can have one extra relic from the Herolums of Conquest for a CP, or two extra relics for three CPs. All of the relics that you include must be different and be given different Astro Militarum characters. You can only uh, use this stratagem once per battle. So you've so you come with a relic as standard, and then you will have two relics, one CP, three CPs for three relics, which is very very handy to have. Okay, right. Uh, remember, uh, Forge World they released a commissar, Lehman Russ tank commander, who's a commissar. Well, now they've done it here. It's, it's, it's kind of like a uh, well, how do I say it? Um, just a unique feature, so to speak, in using that actual model. Uh, it's two CP, two command points. Use this strategy at the start of the first battle round. Before the first turn begins, select a Lehman Russ from your army. Okay. All friendly Astra Militaro units have a leadership characteristic of 9, unless it would otherwise be higher whilst they are in 6 of this vehicle. So Commissar Lehman Russes are back, which is really, really cool. I like that. So that figure now has a purpose in the 40k rulebook and in the codex itself. Uh, right, so mobile command vehicle. Mobile command vehicle. Remember Chimeras? They can't issue orders anymore. Uh, like in previous editions. Now you can for the expense of one command point. Use this stratagem at the start of your turn. Choose a Chimera from your army. Until the end of your turn, an officer of your army with the voice of command ability may still issue orders whilst they are within the Chimera. Measuring ranges from any point of the vehicle as treated for being within three of a Vox Caster. Yep, so you can issue orders from the Chimera, which is fantastic. Uh, preliminary Bombardment. Two command points. Use this strategy after both sides have deployed, but before the first battle round begins, roll a dice for each enemy unit on the battlefield. On a roll of a six, that unit suffers one mortal wound. You can only use this stratagem once per battle. So if you wanted to weaken some guys or units, or key units even, uh, under roll of a six, you cause a mortal wound. Simple as that. Pretty handy. Uh, I used it once. It was okay. Um, I thought I'd try different stratagems just to make it more entertaining. Inspire tactics for one CP, one command point. Uh, use this stratagem after an officer from your army has issued an order or tank order. Uh, the officer may immediately issue an additional order. That's pretty cool. Defensive gunners. This is a really good stratagem. Uh, right. Use this stratagem when a charge is declared against one of your Astra Militarum vehicle units. So it has to be a vehicle unit. Uh, when that unit fires overwatch this phase they successfully hit on a roll of a five or a six instead of only six so it gives vehicles more protection which is very handy 
Bearing in mind, uh, the grinding advance does not apply to Overwatch. It only applies in the shooting phase, so do bear that in mind. Take cover. One command point. Use this stratagem in your opponent's shooting phase. When your opponent selects one of your units as a target, you can add one to the saving throws you make for the unit whilst you're at the end of the phase. So a Lehman Rust could potentially be a 2 plus save, because it only says um, uh, select one of your units. It's interesting. Clarification of words. Grenadiers. This looks fun. Uh, one CP. Use this strategy before an Astro Militar Army infantry unit from your army shoots or fires Overwatch. So that's fair enough. Fine. Shoots or fires Overwatch. Up to 10 models in the unit that are armed with grenades can throw a grenade this phase instead of only firing one model for being able to do so. This is actually quite handy. Uh, usually you can only throw one grenade in one squad, but it says here you can throw up to 10. <laughs> so that's pretty fun. Uh, fight to the death. 1 CP. Use this stratagem at the start of the morale phase. Pick an Astra Militarum infantry unit from your army that is required to take a morale test. You can reroll a D3 for the unit rather than a D6 when taking when taking this test. Uh, 1 CP. Go Recon. Uh, use this stratagem at the start of your shooting phase. Select a unit of the Scout Sentinels from your army. This unit can immediately move 2d6 but cannot shoot or charge this turn. So it may be very, very good stratagem actually because it will grab objectives quickly. So maybe you could do that. So that's cool. Vengeance for Cadia. Uh, 1 CP. Uh, right. Uh, use this stratagem when you select one of your Astra Militarum units to shoot or fire Overwatch. Reroll hit rolls or wound rolls for models in the unit that target chaos at the end of the phase. Now, I thought it was just Cadia uh, order uh, stratagem, but it's not. It's actually Astra Militarum stratagem, so it applies to every regiment. Very powerful, especially against chaos. Cadians do not like chaos, I'll tell you that now. Okay, here are the unique stratagems. Regimental stratagems. So, 1 CP. This is for Mordian stratagem, Mordian Iron Guard. Use this stratagem before Mordian infantry units from your army shoots in the shooting phase. Each time you make a hit roll 6 for the model in that unit, that model can immediately shoot again the same weapon at the same target. These bonus attacks cannot themselves generate further attacks. So that's very powerful. So you roll a hit, I make an additional roll to hit with the same profile, but you can't do it again obviously. That's incredibly powerful actually when you think of it. So hold on a second. Use this strategy before morning infantry unit. The army shoots the shooting phase each time you make a hit roll of six plus make an additional oh right so for example if you're a six say if you have a heavy weapon squad of las cannons yeah if you roll a six you make an additional roll to hit <laughs> that's powerful all right okay um two cp overlapping fields of fire this is a cadian stratagem this is very powerful uh, use this stratagem after a Cadian unit from your army has inflicted an unsaved wound on an enemy unit in the shooting phase. You can add one to hit rolls for any other Cadian units from your army that target the same enemy unit until the end of the phase. So this unit this phase. That's just ridiculously powerful. So for example, you hit with a heavy bolter, wound, that kind of thing. All of all other units hit a plus one ballistic skill. Oh, that's super powerful. Overlapping fields of fire. Uh, send in the next wave is a Valhallen stratagem. Use this stratagem. It's two command points. Use this stratagem at the end of your movement phase. Select a Valhallen infantry unit from your army, including characters and infantry squads that have used the combined squad stratagem that was destroyed earlier in the battle. Set 
up this unit wholly within your deployment zone, within six at the edge of the battlefield, and more than nine from any enemy models. Very powerful. Two CP. Uh, next is Firstborn Pride. One CP. Uh, use this stratagem at the start of your shooting phase. Select a Volstorian unit from your army. You can add one to hit rolls made for this unit until the end of the phase. It's pretty good. Uh, right. Uh, one CP. Superior Intelligence. Uh, time to press the stratagem. One command point. Use this stratagem immediately after your opponent is set up a unit that is arriving on the battlefield as reinforcements within 12 of one of them, your Minasaur and Tempestus infantry units. You, Your unit can immediately shoot that enemy unit as if it were the shooting phase, but you must subtract one to hit rolls. So, in my opinion, that is better than the all spec scanner that the Space Brains have with one CP cheaper. And plus the benefit of uh, their extra hit roll and re-rolling to hit wounds against monstrous creatures. Very powerful. Okay, ambush. Talan stratagem. Three command points. Use this stratagem during your deployment. Choose up to three Talon units to set up in ambush instead of placing them on the battlefield at the end of your movement phases. These units can take can strike from hiding. Set each of them up wholly within seven of the battlefield edge and more than nine away from the enemy models. Wow, that is very powerful. So imagine doing that to a Bane Blade. Woohoo! Okay, uh, Armored Fist, Armageddon Stratagem, 1 CP. Use this stratagem at the start of your shooting phase. Select an ast um, select a Armageddon infantry unit from your army as described from the Armageddon that's disembarked from the Armageddon transport uh, vehicle this turn. You can reroll hit rolls of one for that unit until the end of the phase. So double tapping of plasma with uh, supercharging, get to reroll ones with CP. It's pretty useful. Rerolling ones for other weapons. Yeah, it's good. Uh, vicious traps, catch and stratagem. Uh, one CP. Use this stratagem when an enemy unit finishes a charge move within one of the catch and units from your army that is wholly within a terrain feature. Roll a dice for a four plus. The enemy suffers D3 mortal wounds. It's <laughs> pretty cool, that is. All right. Okay, we're on to the psychic disciplines now. Psychic discipline. So. These are the powers you can cast. Terrifying Visions, uh, Warp Charge value of 7. Pretty high. If manifested, choose an enemy unit within 18 of the Psyker. That unit subtracts 2 from its leadership until the start of your next turn. That's pretty high power, uh, Warp Charge, that is. For a not that amazing ability. That's just my opinion. Maybe it'll be... Uh, pretty good. Depending, it's a circumstantial uh, power that is to cast. Number two is Gaze of the Emperor. Gaze of the Emperor has a warp charge value of six. If manifested, draw a straight line of sight, straight line 2d6 long, directly away from the psyker. Roll a line, roll a dice for each model in the center of the line uh, passes over. On a four plus, that model suffers a mortal wound. Uh, psychic Barrier. Uh, psychic Barrier is a warp charge value of 6. If manifested, select a friendly Astro Militarum unit within 12 of the Psyker until the start of your next Psychic Phase. Add 1 to the unit's saving throws. Okay, that's very different. Uh, add 1 to... actually that's pretty good. Actually, so add 1 to the saving throws. So you could add that you could apply it to tanks, you could apply that to um, flyers and infantry even in colour. It could be quite useful. And a warp charge value of six is not bad. Night Shroud. Night Shroud has a warp charge value of six. If manifest is select uh, 
choose a friendly Astra Militarum unit with 12 the Psyker until the start of the next turn. An enemy unit that targets the chosen unit with a ranged weapon suffers a minus one penalty to hit. That's pretty good. Night Shroud is actually very good. Um, a mental Fortitude, uh, power five. Mental Fortitude is warp chart value four. If manifested, select a friendly Astrominatari unit within 12 of the Psyker. Until the start of your next Psychic days, that unit automatically passes morale tests. That'd be quite good, actually. Very handy. Hmm. Um. Yeah, that's good. That's a good one. Fort charge value of four, it's cheap. Uh, Psychic Maelstrom, warp charge value of seven. Uh, Psychic Maelstrom is warp charge value of 7. If manifested, select an enemy unit within 18 of the Psyker. Or a D6 on a 2 plus, the unit suffers a mortal wound unless the mortal wound is negated. You can then re uh, you can then roll another dice on a 3 plus, that enemy suffers another mortal wound. Continue the process, adding 1 to the dice roll required each time, so that the next mortal wound needs a 4 plus, then 5 plus, then 6 plus, etc. Until you fail to cause a mortal wound or enemy unit is destroyed. That's cool. That's pretty powerful, that one. Rare, but you have to keep rolling. But it's, 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 it's fluffy and fun at the same time. So, there you go. Okay, heirlooms of Conquest. These are relics that you can have. The Emperor's Benediction. Commissar or Lord Commissar with a bolt pistol only. The Emperor's Benediction replaces the model's bolt pistol and has the following profile. The Emperor's Benediction, range 12, pistol 3, strength 4, AP minus 1, 2 damage. Abilities. This weapon cannot this weapon can target a character even if they are not the closest enemy unit, unless the bearer is within one of an enemy unit. That's pretty handy. Bearing in mind this is all for free, so spend a CP. Uh, right, Laurels of Command. The officer of the Vice of Command ability. Roll a dice each time the bearer issues an order to a friendly regiment unit within six of them. On a four plus, the bearer can immediately issue another order to the same unit. This does not count towards the maximum number of orders this model may issue each turn. Useful. And Death Masks of Orleanus. Infantry model only. Uh, the bearer of this item has a 4 plus invulnerable save. In addition, once per game, at the start of any of your turns, the bearer may immediately heal d3 wounds. That's pretty good. Um, the dagger of Tuskia. Uh, during deployment, you can set up the bearer of the infantry unit of your army behind enemy lines, intending to place them on the battlefield. The infantry unit must have the same regiment keyword as the bearer of, if the bearer is, has one. At the end of any of your movement phase, these units can launch their daring attack. Sent them within three of each other and anywhere on the battlefield, it's wholly within six of the battlefield edge and nine away from the new models. So that's, that's a pretty good uh, relic that is. Yeah. Um, Kratrov's Aquila. Officers only. Each time your opponent uses a stratagem, roll a d6 on a 5 plus, you gain a command point. So there is a chance that you can steal a command point. Alright. Uh, that's very good, that actually. I like that one. Uh, the Blade of Conquest. Uh, model with this power sword only. The Bane. The Blade of Conquest replaces the model's power sword and has the following profile. Blade of Conquest is range melee type melee strength plus 2 AP minus 4 D3 damage. Okay, this is here is probably the most powerful relic. Uh, the relic of Lost Cadia. Cadian model only. Uh, the model, uh, the model, uh, sorry, the Cadian model only. The bearer can unveil the relic at the start of any turn. Until the end of that turn, you can reroll hit and wound rolls of one um, for all Cadian units within 12 of the bearer 
you can instead re-roll all fail to hit and to wound rolls for those against units until the end of the turn if they are targeting a chaos unit. Whoa. So you, can you just imagine the wrath of Cadia? I hold this like piece of Cadia on the planet and people get hyped up about it and they're like, for Cadia, and they fight against the hordes of chaos. Just imagine the cinematics in that. There's a brilliant, brilliant relic. I'll most likely be taking that one. Um, the Mammoth's Tusk Blade. Uh, Kachan model with a power sword only. The Mammoth Tusk Blade replaces the model's power sword and has the following profile. The Mammoth's Tusk Blade. Range melee, type melee, strength plus 2, AP minus 3, 2 damage. Let's go. Pietrov's Mach 45. Valhallen model with a bolt pistol only. Pietrov's Mark 45 replaces the model's bolt pistol and has the following profile. Weapon. Pietrov's Mark 45. Range 12. Pistol. Strength 4, AP minus 1, 2 damage. Abilities. Uh, friendly Valhallen units within 6 of the bearer can never lose more than one model as a result of a single failed round test. Not bad. The armor of Graf Toskientio. Vostorian only. Uh, Vostorian infantry models only. Increase the model's toughness characteristic to 4, save characteristic to 2 plus. Hmm. That's good. Uh, next is the Skull of Akron. Armageddon character only. Enemy units within three of the bearer suffer minus one penalty to their leadership. Orcs suffer minus two penalty instead. So if you wanted to play a lore-based fluffy game, Armageddon still Legion against Orcs. That's a good one to have. Uh, Claw of the Desert Tigers. Uh, Talon model, uh, model with a power sword only. Uh, the Claw of the Desert Tigers replaces the model's power sword and has the following profile. Claw of the Desert Tigers is range melee, type melee, strength fuser, AP minus 3, 2 damage. Abilities. Each time the bearer fights, it can make two additional attacks with this weapon. That's good. Tactical Audio Relicroy of Tiberius. Meditarum Tempestus models only. When using the voice to command ability, this model can issue one additional order per turn. Roll a dice before issuing an additional order on a roll of a one. The reliquary issues contradictory nonsense and nothing happens. <laughs> okay. Uh, order of the Iron Star of Mordian. So it's Mordian only. Mordian infantry. Model only. Each time the bearer suffers a wound, a mortal wound, or a dice on a 4 plus, the wound is negated and has no effect. Very powerful, actually. Ability. So, now we're looking on to Warlord traits. These are the standard Warlord traits that you can choose from. You can still choose them from the rulebook, but these Warlord traits are still very powerful. Number one is probably the most powerful, in my opinion. Grand Strategist. Whilst your war is alive, you can re-roll a single hit roll, wound roll, or saving throw per battle. In addition, if your army is battle-forged and this warlord is on the battlefield, roll a dice for each command point spent when using stratagems of 5+. Plus. That command point is immediately refunded. So you can gain, regain command points on a 5+, plus after you spend them. And with the relic here... Uh, the Kyatrov's Aquila, you can actually steal your opponent's command points on a 5+. plus. Add them two together, you've got a strategic genius here. Um, old Grudges, number two. After deployment, before the first battle round begins, choose a unit in your opponent's army. You can reroll failed wound rolls for Astra Militarum units for your army. That target unit, whilst your um, so I'll read that again. Minotaurum, Astro Minotaurum units from your army that target the unit you choose whilst they are in six of your warlord. Mm, that's good. That's good. So uh, you re-roll with found to wound. It's always useful. The re-rolls are great. 
Even if it's re-roll ones, it's still very, very handy. Uh, Implaceable Determination. Um, your Warlord and a single friendly unit, three of them, advances. They have both at six to their movement characteristic for that movement phase instead of rolling a dice. Nice, flat six inches. Um, Draconian Disciplinarian. Uh, you can re-roll failed merit tests for, for friendly Astra Militarum infantry units within six of your Warlord in the morale phase. Pretty handy. Uh, bellowing voice, add three to the range of any abilities of your Warlord uh, data sheets, such as a raw discipline and voice of command. Uh, Master of command. Uh, your Warlord gains the voice of command ability. If your Warlord already has the voice of command, uh, or tank orders ability, you may instead issue one additional order per turn. So, uh, named characters and warlord traits. If a named character with a specific regiment keyword is your warlord, they must be given the associated warlord trait. For example, Colonel Einhard Strachan must take the catch and lead them from the front warlord trait. See opposite, as he has the catch and keyword. If your uh, Commissar Yarrick is your warlord, he must have the Master Command warlord trait. See above. So he has to have that. Uh, that's the standard warlord traits. Now we're going to go to the regimental warlord traits. So, starting off, Cadia. Cadia. Uh, roll a dice each time your warlord issues an order or a tank order on a 4 plus. That order is effect an additional Cadian unit of the same type as the original target uh, infantry or even Russ in six of your warlord. That's handy, very handy. Uh, Catchans, lead from the front. Lead from the front. Lead from the front. This warlord can perform an heroic intervention if after the enemy has completed its charge moves they are within six of any enemy units. The Warlord can move to six when preferring to heroic intervention, so long as they end the move closer to the nearest enemy model. In addition, if your Warlord was charged, was charged and performed heroic intervention, then until the end of your turn, you can reroll found hit rolls for, that, for them. Yeah, that's good. That's powerful, that is. So rerolls to hit. Mm, it's good. Uh, Val Hallen. Uh, tenacious is his war trait. Uh, roll a dice each time your warlord suffers a wound or mortal wound. On a 5 plus, the wound is ignored, and your warlord has the vehicle keyword. Uh, so, if the vehicle has your vehicle keyword, it's 6 instead. That's pretty handy. Uh, voice Dorian. Uh, honored Duelist. Reroll failed to hit and to wound rolls in the fight phase for attacks made by your warlord. Pretty handy. Give him a good equipment. They can be very, very handy indeed. Ex-gang leader. Uh, Armageddon. Add one to the warlord's attacks characteristic. In addition, add one to any wound uh, rolls made for your warlord in the fight phase. Just add one to the wound rolls. <laughs> he's, he's hard. Uh, Talon. Swift attacker. Your warlord and all friendly Talon units in six can charge even if they fell back on this turn. <laughs> so you can counter attack. It's kind of like the old rules for counter attacking. Uh, Minotaur and Tempestus. Your warlord can attempt to deny one psychic power in each of your psychic phase in the same manner as a psyker. It's pretty handy. Uh, Mordian. Roll a dice. Each model that flees from a friendly Mordian unit in six of your warlord. Uh, in your morale phase. On a 4+, plus, that model does not flee. That's pretty good. And then all the points values as listed over here. And there's one thing I'd like to point out. That is equipment for vehicles. Uh, we'll go over, we'll just go back quickly. Here we go, other gear. Now, this will be for light like, tanks and etc. So, a Gura Ray. This is for Lehman Russes and that kind of thing, Chimeras. 
Agura Ray, once per battle round in the shooting phase, you can re-roll a single failed hit roll for a vehicle within the Agura Ray. So that's a useful upgrade, that is. So like Vanquisher Cannon, that kind of thing, with an Agura Ray, can be very useful indeed. Dozer Blade. Uh, if a vehicle with a Dozer Blade charges in the charge phase, add one to hit rolls made until the end of the ensuing fight phase. So, a Leon Rust needs sixes to hit you normally, but with Dozer Blade, it's five points, and the points cost. Points cost uh, other weapons and gear. A dozer blade is five points. A gura ray is ten points. And then the last one is track guards, and I believe that's five points. No, that's ten points. The track guards can be quite expensive. But a vehicle with track cards always counts as having its starting characteristic of wounds deter uh, uh, determining its move characteristic, i.e. the move characteristic does not decrease as it suffers wounds. So that's fair enough. So, uh, we're up to here, and then extra unique objective missions. And that concludes... The Astra Militarum 8th Edition Codex Review. What do I think of Astra Militarum Codex 8th Edition? It is absolutely fantastic. The new rules, everything, the layout, the wording, the law, the rules themselves make more sense. They've tidied it up a lot. It's just overall a better codex and a better army, and it makes Imperial Guard so much more competitive. Uh, every regiment, there's, they have their unique uh, abilities, and that which is really, really good. What Games Workshop are doing. Uh, the only there's only, there's obviously a couple of things I went through through the review, but the one thing they haven't done, sadly, is they haven't done and re-upgraded the older regiments such as Morgan Iron Guard, Armageddon Steel Legion. And what else have they done? Vostorians are lead as well, and Valhallans. They're all in lead figures, which I wish they would do in plastic. They should do a plastic sprue for those kind of upgrades. Maybe they'll do them some one day. Um, there's no additional new units as such, because they're trying to update all the codexes now, which is a good thing. But other than that, it's a fantastic codex. Um, I look forward to it every time. I used to be like, oh, I don't really like using Pure Guard in 8th edition, but now I love it. Uh, this is a saving grace for me. And it's nicely laid, out, nicely laid out, as I said. I'm just overwhelmed by how good this codex is. Used it a few times. Very powerful codex indeed. Do check out Luke's battle reports on his channel. And hopefully I'll do my own battle reports on this channel as well. So there you go. Thank you very much for watching. It's been a long review, I know. Uh, whilst you're doing painting, probably, I can imagine. Uh, people doing painting whilst they listen to my uh, explanation of the rules. So, there you go. Thank you very much for listening and thank you very much for watching. Remember, if you like my content, if you want to support me and what I do, please remember to leave a like and a comment. And if you'd like to support me more, you can support me on my social media pages and you can subscribe to this channel. YouTube channel of mine. So there you go. That concludes the Astra Militarum 8th edition uh, codex review of Warhammer 40,000. Have a good day. Happy board gaming. I hope to see you in the next episode.